Good afternoon, good afternoon everybody, as the warthog there looks up and stares into our eyes. Welcome to a live safari here in the midst of the Great Kruger National Park. That is a warthog and for the next three hours you're going to be with us on a live safari. That means we'd love to talk to you. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. My name is James Hendry and on camera today we've got Viam Dorenbrak. That is his uh, fairly lengthy thumb for a man of his stature. We are neither of us very long. Uh, we are both quite short and that of course will give us more fuel to explore the wonders of this area. This area, of course, is the western fringes of the Great Kruger National Park, an iconic national park of the world. Eight million acres, untrammeled African wilderness we're in, and the section we're on here is a little place called Juma. To the west of us, we traverse Arethusa, and to the east of us, a place called Cheetah Plains. All in all, about four and a half hectares, which if you work it out in acres, you multiply it by 2.4 in your mind, and you get roughly 11,000 or so acres. So that's what we're going to explore today. We've come into this area hoping to find a female leopard, Karula. She's a 12-year-old female. She's got two little cubs in this area. They're four months old as of today, believe it or not. And they were seen just to the south of this road where we are now. Now, we can't go south of here. We have had a look there. They aren't around at the moment, but we're going to stay around here. The mother's tracks went north into Juma, which is the area we traverse, and so we'll have a look around here for her. In the meantime, however, there's some really wonderful, interesting stuff going on. We've got the kudu there. There is a nyala bull in the bushes through there. He's one of the most common antelope species that we get here, but he's not so easily visible. So I'm going to roll gently down the hill and inside this dry riverbed or drainage line, the great valley of the Mulwati drainage that we're sinking down into. Look, it's not going to compete with the valley of the Nile for size, but it's equally picturesque. There was some kudu and there was some nyala. There is the back end of one of the nyala. The nyala. Everything else seems to have absconded. So what we're going to do, you can have a quick look at the back end of that nyala. Oh, there we go. We've got the front end now. Beautiful color, wonderful chestnut red glowing in the late afternoon sun here. Well, it's not that late afternoon, but we've only got about two hours of sunlight left. And you can see me sitting in my shirt sleeves. We are, of course, in the middle of winter, believe it or not. 25 degrees centigrade it is, that's around 77 degrees Fahrenheit, which I don't think is half bad for the middle of winter. So let's go up a little bit further here. We're going to look down around the termite mound where Karula left her two little cubs and we'll see if we can get sight of them. The camera that we're using at the moment has got a magnificent zoom on it, so with any luck we'll be lucky. Right, Viam, have you got your leopard spotting eyes in your head? Now, Karula gave birth to these cubs not too far from here, and then she stashed them. Now, this is a major access road to some of the great tourism lodges that are along this road, Chitra Chitra and Cheetah Plains off to the eastern side, and she stashed them in a culvert, in a concrete culvert. And, of course, caves are few and far between in an area like this because the landscape is gentle, undulating, granitic topography, very sandy soils, very few caves. And so leopards, when they give birth, will make use of just about any kind of shelter or cave-like structure that they can. Now, where she left them was just inside here. Now, I'm going to ask VM to show you the termite mound where they were. It's just over there. That's it there. They were just apparently the other side of that termite mound. So we're, going to not, we're not going to spend too long here. We're going to have a look for the mum shortly. We're going to go a little bit forward. I can't see them there now. You can't see them, can you, Viam? No. No, no, not quite. So let's just sneak slowly forward and we'll just peer around the other side of the mound there. And if we're very lucky, we'll see two tiny little spotty faces looking at us. Now she'll be off hunting. They've weaned these two cubs, so like I say, they're four months old as of today. They've weaned completely, and that means, well, just about completely, 
and that means that they're going to be very hungry and they'll be in need of meat quite frequently and so they're well, one hates to say ageing, but uh, coming to the twilight of her year's mother is having to work very hard. She's highly successful. She's raised eight cubs uh, to adulthood or to independence so far, and that's pretty good return for a leopard. It's not easy. Probably only about one in eight or so leopards make it to independence. All right, so I think we're going to... We'll come back here when it gets a little bit cooler and see if we can't spot them. In the meantime, what we're going to do is go forward to the east here, cut north, and come back around on a loop. There's a road through here, and she does like to hunt in this block over here, so we might be very lucky and find her tracks crossing the road, or perhaps she'll just be sauntering down it in a feline manner, perhaps dragging an impala with her. That would be very pleasant, wouldn't it, Vian? Well, not if you were the impala, of course, then it would be deeply unpleasant. So like I say, her tracks go in there. In the final control today while we drive along here is Kirsten McLennan Smith directing. I can't hear a thing. Oh, there we go. Right. Uh, here's Kirsty, and Kirsty just said to me we're going to link across to the other presenter for the day, Jamie Patterson, being filmed by Brian Joubert. While James searches and scours for Karula, the Queen of Juma, Brian and myself have been scouring the western edge of Juma for her daughter Shadow and whilst we haven't found a spotted cat just yet we have found some stripy horses to show you oh and a little photobomb there by a <laughs> butterfly <laughs> that was wonderful good afternoon my name is Jamie and this afternoon on Wendy's portion of the sunset safari I have Brian on camera with me and hopefully the thumb will bring us luck in searching for the spotted cats be the first time if we do find Shadow that we have seen her brand new cub or at least a couple of months old cub by now really keeping our fingers crossed that that is the way that our portion of the sunset safari will go in the meantime our zebra taking advantage of the last few moments of a warm winter's afternoon before the bitter chill of sunset and evening arrives don't forget to send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. Let's see if we can get some incredible conversations sparked of some of the wonderful animals that we get to see out here. We've got two mares standing in the shade accompanied by their standard consort of oxpeckers and then a mare and her almost grown filly who looks as though she might have had a brush with something relatively dangerous at some point in her past. If you have a look around the back end of the zebra behind, the youngest one, you can see all of those strange mismatched shapes to her stripes. Places where the stripes don't quite connect where they might usually and a lot of the time that is from scarring of some sort whether it is an escape from one of the big cats or hyenas or wild dogs when she was a little bit younger or even harsh treatment from the other zebra in her herd. Life is not always that easy for a zebra. They can be quite, not vicious animals, vicious is definitely the wrong word, but perhaps very forceful in their personalities and very um, intolerant of zebra that stray outside of the traditional hierarchy that filly may well have had a tough start to life, possibly even approaching the wrong female and got herself a kick or a nip for her troubles. However, she has reached the stage now where she is almost an adult, past the most dangerous phase of a zebra foal's life, and now she's going to be embarking on a whole new journey. For there will come a time when another male will compete with her father and if he loses, she will become a part of that male's harem. He will steal her away, and she will set out on a different life, away from the rest of her herd in which she was born. In this beautiful afternoon sunlight, you can even see the beards on the zebra. Well, they stand 
standing sort of half in the shade and half in the sun. It's a beautiful afternoon out here in the Sabi sand. Lizzie Bear, you were wondering about how does a zebra adapt to the temperature? There's an interesting theory about that. I don't think I, I personally buy it. There is a theory that the stripes of the zebra, not just for camouflage, but in fact play a very important role in their thermodynamics and their thermoregulation. So essentially, the theory runs that the black stripes heat up far faster than the white stripes, therefore creating microcurrents of air along the zebra's skin, which in turn helps to cool them down. And you can make of, your, of that theory what you will. Personally, I find that one a little bit harder to believe, especially since most of the animals out here have to deal with the heat and have evolved to deal with the heat in a number of different ways, but none that involves stripes or patterns of colors. I struggle with that particular theory. For me, my favorite explanation as my favorite explanation as to why zebra have stripes is actually because it interferes with the landing vision of things like tsetse flies and other flying, biting insects. Essentially, they can't quite figure out where the animal begins and ends. And as a result, that's borne out by scientific evidence that shows that zebra have far less in the way of tsetse flies and other biting things than, than, than other animals of a similar size. So an interesting little theory. And then, of course, there's the traditional camouflage, which works very well if you see the zebra together as a herd or as a group. It becomes very difficult for the human eye, at least, to distinguish from one from another. And as she wanders further into the shade, I've just heard word that there's one of our more unusual animal species just behind us. And I think that we should go and investigate. It's been exceptionally fortunate. When I first started working here, we hardly ever saw jackal. Recently, we've been seeing them more and more. And I think that a pair of side-striped jackal is establishing a territory just to the north of where we are. So let us go and see if they are there. I can see them on my way past, but it doesn't mean they weren't. They could well have been hiding up in the shade somewhere. Let's go and investigate. The last time I saw Jackal was one extraordinary morning not too long ago where we watched the two different species of Jackal, a side striped and a black jack, trying to sneak up to a pair of hyenas that had the remains of a buffalo kill and were playing on it and sort of chewing on it absent-mindedly. Jackal displaying great courage in terms of approaching those animals, trying to see if they could grab a morsel here and there. I hear tell that they are just around the corner, so while we go and search high and low, or probably low, for our jackal, let's go back across to James to see if he has any updates for us. I must say, I hope those jackal have found. They're such special animals, and while I guess in many parts of the world a fox is considered something of vermin, uh, the jackal out here is a great and cunning canid. Uh, that's called alliteration, VM. Did you like it? I loved it. You loved it, good. Now, we're on our way. What I've decided to do, we have a tracking team out at the moment, and they are helping look for that leopardess. So what we're going to do is head towards Biffleshook Dam, which is a water hole in the northeast corner of the reserve that we're on now and see it's been quite a warm day like I say 25 degrees Celsius 77 Fahrenheit and maybe there'll be something that's come down to have a drink. Water of course is now going to become something of a premium over the next few months because we're into the winter and you know it can sometimes not rain here for up to three months at a time during the winter season and we had a very poor rainy season so I think it's going to be extremely dry by the time October and November rolls around. And by then, the water holes will be full of action. But even now, in the middle of the year, in June, as we head towards the middle of winter, so the water holes will be increasingly active. Now, VM, of course, one of the major joys of living in the bush, everyone, is the fact that uh, we get these amazing smells. And very unusually, people don't normally associate uh, dung with a pleasant smell. Uh, however, 
Elephant dung aged just to the correct age, say about three weeks, oh, is one of the most amazing smells you can smell out here. And I'm not being facetious in the slightest, VMP. Mm, that's a good that's a good year. It is a good year, isn't it? It's a good vintage. Mm. Yeah, it's a good vintage elephant dung this. Mm. So what I want you to do, everybody, is just is kind of um imagine, close your eyes if you would, take a deep breath in, and imagine the most fertile soil that you've ever smelt in your life mixed in with a bit of the most delicious mushroom dish that you've ever eaten. And you'll come some way to understand a little bit of sweetness in there, a bit of maybe a bit of a, a potpourri and you'll get some idea of the delicious vintage of this very fine elephant dung. Mm. Oh, sorry, quickly, before, I mean, I'm being slightly ridiculous, uh, slight, before we leave, just a quick idea. We're into now the winter months, of course. The elephants are not eating grass. That would be their preferred food during the summer. They're eating sticks, which are pretty devoid of nutrients. They're eating leaves that you can see there and they're eating twigs and the odd sort of grassy stalk, but mainly it's twigs and leaves and bark at the moment. Righty, let's head across to Jamie. She's managed to find those cunning canids. There we go, the updates prove to be true. And there, if you look particularly closely into that patch of shade, You'll just see the twitching ears of a side-striped jackal. Now, I know that it is particularly difficult to see when it's lying down flat like this, but it is most definitely a side-striped. It is slightly larger than the other species of jackal that we get here, which is the black-backed jackal. Slightly larger and with a slightly longer nose, so a more extended profile when it turns its head to the side. Oh, for those flies, driving the poor thing mad. And then just slightly smaller than the, ba than the black back jackal in terms of its ear size. I'm relatively certain that this is one of a pair. On jackals, typically, you'll find them in small family groups, the core members of which are the male and female that are monogamous and mate for life. Um, it, ha it helps that I have seen this pair before. I don't know where the second jackal is at the moment, but I'm sure it's hiding out somewhere close to its mate in the shade. A very good afternoon to James Richard, who's been doing some reading up on jackals. I know that James Richards really enjoys a good jackal sighting. And apparently, James, you've read that the side-striped jackal is more closely related to wolves than any other jackal species, and you're wondering if that's true. I can't speak for the side-striped jackal per se, but I can tell you that every single member of the jackal family is very, very genetically close to wolves. It's an interesting thing. There's clearly a shared ancestor somewhere in the back of their evolutionary background. Oh, there we go. There you can see it a little bit clearly as it looks up at us. And at a distance like this, with its colors, you could be forgiven for thinking it looks a lot like a little miniature wolf. Uh, the canid family their members tend to be all very, very closely related to the point that, of course, dogs and wolves can interbreed and, in fact, apparently jackals and dogs can as well. It's just something that very, very seldom happens naturally in the wild. So they're very close together in terms of their genetic structure and their evolutionary background. The same applies to each and every jackal species. So the golden jackal in North Africa, right down to our black-backed and our side-striped jackal here. Now, James, I wish I could tell you whether or not I know it to be true that the side-striped is more closely related to the wolf, but I have heard some theories that the side-striped jackal is thought to be one of the original jackal, or at least closer to the original jackal ancestor in terms of evolution. So the first species to evolve and the oldest jackal species. I've read that as a theory, though. 
I'm not 100% sure if that is a widely accepted explanation as to their background. What's fascinating about it is the fact that you have two species here that are so, so similar in the way that they operate. Whether it is the blackback jackal or the side striped jackal, they fulfill essentially the same ecological niche. And yet, they are quite tolerant of each other in each other's space. They're only territorial to members of the same species, so jackals of the same species. And they, as we saw a couple of days ago with the two side striped and the blackbacked, they get on, if not, you know, they're never going to be frolicking friends, but they get on relatively well in terms of their interaction with each other. Now, I find that incredibly fascinating, that we've got something in the evolutionary background that caused two species to evolve completely separately, because they are two distinct species, and yet occupy such a similar niche. Your guess is as good as mine as to exactly how that happens, and it might be one of those great mysteries, something that we just never know the answer to. And that, in a way, is one of the things that I love about being out here, is that we don't have all of the answers, and we're probably never going to get all of the answers up to us to interpret things the way in which we wish. And if we're really lucky, if we just, <laughs> if the jackal decides to stay with us, we might even have the possibility of jackal pups in the not too distant future. If, they, if this pair establishes themselves here, we could have a whole little family of jackal and that would be an ideal dream of mine to be able to show you what a jackal pup looks like because I promise you that there's not much cuter out here. The reason we cannot go any closer, just to explain it to you, is at the moment South Africa is caught in the grips of a crippling drought. The worst drought probably in the last hundred or so years. What that means is that particularly, this is a particularly sensitive area, um, if we do off-road we inevitably cause damage to the environment and here with very little grass cover there's hardly any grass left we cannot go off-road at all because we will risk damaging the environment the only times we do go off-road in order to minimize our impact is when we are following a leopard or a lion wild dogs something of that nature something incredibly special and incredibly rare but keep your eyes peeled and stay tuned because you never know when these jackal are going to come a bit closer to the road. Luckily, although we can't off-road, there are other ways of exploring the bush and one of those is on foot. So let's find out how Steph's bushwalk is going. You catch me at my favorite termite mound. I must be honest with you, this is a termite mound very close to where we stay and I like visiting here probably once every two or three days or so. It's a massive termite mound and it is really, really active and that's why I like it is because there's always something going on. And when I got here, this chimney was open and in it were all these soldiers. So I wanted them to come out because I want to show you exactly what's going on. And what I did to get them out is blow inside here. Making it, for them at least, making it seem as if there was an animal that is busy digging around and scratching around at the top over here and, um, and letting them come out. Now while they come out, it gives me a, ta a time to say hello properly. I'm Stefan Winterboer and you are on the Sunset Bushwalk with myself and Jean-Ré here. And uh, there we go. As you can see, they've now started to come out. But I didn't just want to, I didn't just want to get them out for no reason whatsoever. I actually wanted to show you how you fish for termites. Now, for some of you, you might understand that termites, they're not ants. Here we go, here's one right here, walking over here. They actually belong to the same family that cockroaches belong to. And it doesn't take too much imagination, although not with this guy's big head, to see where they actually come from. Here's another one up here walking around. What they're doing is they're busy patrolling, looking for the intruder. And they're going to use those big muscular heads that they've got and those very, very sharp, powerful jaws to hopefully see me off. Now, enough of them definitely will see me off. I tell you, these things bite like you never, like you never understand. But what, why I want to do this? They also hold on to the grass quite a lot. Now, let me see if I can put it in here and I can get a couple of them onto the grass for you. And why I want to do that is because this is probably the easiest form of food 
that we can get. Have a look at that. So I've got two of them on the end of my grass. One just let go there. But let's see if we can get another one. And what you do basically is you, you then just strip off that termite into a bowl or into a cup or into a snail shell. And you can eat them raw or you can fry them up. They taste a lot like just wood chips. But 300 grams of beef is equal to 100 grams of these guys. And so they're very, very, very nutritious. And protein, as we know, allows us to do all the things that we can do. Our brains use a massive amount of protein. But on that note, I think it would be good to go and catch up with one of the drives. And we'll see you a bit later. That, everybody, is a grey heron. So, not quite the great plethora of herds of elephant that I hope, was hoping were going to be at the water here, but the grey heron, a spectacular bird that is distributed all over, believe it or not, the old world. So, it's found all over Asia and Europe, except in the very coldest places like northern Siberia. Nobody wants to live there. And, of course, in the deserts of the Sahara. But otherwise, the grey heron is all over the place. And this particular one, lives here at what we call Biffle's Hook Dam, and we're in the northeast corner, like I say, of Juma. And a patient heron is waiting to try and see if it can catch a tilapia. That's the sort of, that's a standard issue fish that we get in a dam like this, and that's their standard food. They will take rodents, and they'll take the odd uh, frog if they can get it, and even the odd bird, and I believe on the wing, although I've never seen that. It's just a really nice picture of a heron in some green pea soup coloured water. Not the only resident here today. We've got some buffalo there. Two old boys shooting the breeze with each other, talking of better times when they were moving with the herd, when they were young and strong, as opposed to slightly old and overweight like they are now. And interestingly, as long as there's water, despite the extent of the drought that we've had, and despite the fact that we're probably going to go into even drier times, these buffalo have hardly lost any condition at all. And so if they've got water to eat, they will eat the most dry, seemingly nutrition-free vegetation and be perfectly fine. And that's all that's going on here. There's quite a lot of bird life sort of singing around in the trees above us. You might just be able to hear the swizzling call of the blue waxbill. But very difficult to try and spot. They're sitting around in the trees here. I'm not going to ask VM to try and find them. And we've got one other bird I want to show you before we move on. And the other bird is called a grey go away bird. And there are two. One very close to us in this tree that we can hardly see. But there's another one on the top of that dead tree over there, VM. He's that grey sort of splotch. At the bottom of your screen is a grey go-away bird. Wonderful picture of that, isn't it, Viam? The best. The best ever. Okay, there's a better one on the top of that tree there. And that's the grey go-away bird. So cool. Now, they're magnificent looking creatures. Oh, there he goes. He's flown away. Typical. That was a good guess, Viam, but I'm afraid it failed. All right. Let's carry on. What we're going to do is follow the line of the dry riverbed that was fed by this sort of water hole and it goes down towards the south, back towards where we had those leopard cubs earlier. And we'll see if we can't find some elephants in the middle there. And maybe some other creatures. And just remember everybody, we are live, which means we'd love to hear from you. Send us your comments or questions about what we're seeing. You might even just like to ask us questions about South Africa, which is the country we're in, otherwise about the African continent in general. And you can send those, if you're on the Tweet Tweet, to hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. There's a brown-crowned chagra, everyone. We don't often see them like this. They fly into the thick bush. Look at his lovely rufous colours. And I don't know if you can see there, he's got that little tooth at the end of his bill. It's a black crown chagra, sorry, you can see the black crown there. And you can see the tooth on the edge of the bill 
which of course differentiates us and identifies this bird as a member of the shrike family. All the shrikes have got those little teeth at the front of their beaks. Isn't that wonderful? I think he thinks that we can't see him. He thinks he's well hidden, you see. There he goes. They make the most beautiful call. Let me play you the call quickly while we're driving along. I'll play you the call of the Chagra. Chagra is spelt T-C-H. No, it's not. Yes, it is. <laughs> and this is, this is the call of the black crowned Chagra. Isn't that lovely? I think that's the most beautiful call. And while we're looking down the drainage line here, let's head across to Jamie and see what she has found. James has been bird watching at Wuffelshoek Dam. We've been investigating the western boundary. Now, this is a really curious patch of land when it comes to our leopards of the area. From what we can tell, this is the boundary of Karula's territory next to her daughter's territory. And of course, with leopard territories, it's not like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle that where one ends, the other begins. And in fact, it is a little bit more complex than that. What I mean by that is that the boundaries are kind of fluid. When Karula's on the far side of her territory, Shadow's territory might extend a little bit into her mom's. Now we, as far as we can tell, this is the divide between Karula and her oldest daughter, Shadow. And she shares a boundary with Shadow's twin sister, a little bit to the south and east of us, around the uh, around the little Gauri Chitwa property. That's pretty much normal for a leopardess. She gives portions of her territorial area to her daughters once they grow up and they become independent. Almost like handing off a piece of property to one's daughter. Doesn't work quite the same with their sons though. That is completely different. With the sons have to go off and establish territories of their own somewhere else. And this boundary, we've encountered Shadow and Karula on once before, not fighting each other, because it's very seldom with related female leopards that you'll get an out-and-out -out physical fight, but a bit of growling and a bit of blowing of spit bubbles on behalf of the Queen of Juma, very undignified for such a lady, but that was how it played out. And we're coming along the Balanites Road on the western edge of Juma, this is where her tracks were last seen. And in fact, now that you have a rough idea of where we are, let's show you what a leopard track looks like. Or at least let's try to. It's a bit tricky, they're quite faded. I'm going to try and show you what they look like. And this is, we can almost guarantee that these are shadows tracks because we know exactly where Karula is. Unfortunately, she's walked in a very awkward place. We try find a nice position for you. This is a termite mound right there. Let's try, let's try a bit further forward. Otherwise you're not going to be able, maybe you might be able to see it in the shade of the vehicle. What I'll do is, since we can't show you it as clearly as I would like to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump out and I'm going to show you and I'll trace the outline of her track so that you get a rough idea of what it is you're looking for. The door needs a bit of a kick to get it open. So she's come along down this road, and I think the easiest track for you to see, can you see this one, Brian, here? I'll trace it out for you, and we'll trace the next one along as well. Let's find a good drawing stick without disturbing her track. So this is the track of a female leopard. Really tricky for you to see in this light. But here's the outline and the three back pads on the back of her heel. And then one little toe, two little toe, three little toe, four little toe. 
can only be a female leopard with a track this size. If this were a male leopard, it would be a cub of maybe just a few months old. Let's try, get a little bit closer. Here is her next track. I'm not going to trace this one, but here is her next track going along here and off just into this block around the Gauri repeater. Where is she and what is she up to? Don't see any little cub tracks around. That doesn't mean that they weren't with her, it just means there's a chance that they were driven over as vehicles moved through. Okay, we have a starting point and luckily for us we're not alone in tracking shadow. Brent is out exploring the area as well on foot, trying to see if he can't find her. And if anyone can find you a leopard, that is Greg Leo Smith. I'm going to do a circuit of this block just in case she's been chased a bit further south by elephants. I can see lots and lots of ele elephant tracks moving into this area. And there's a distinct possibility with elephants. They tend to be quite intolerant of the presence of predators. Even a leopard that is of absolutely no threat to them, they still will go out of their way to chase that animal. And as we travel along, a very warm welcome to Mrs. Wanzong's class in Kempsville Meadows Elementary School. Hello everybody, just a quick introduction, my name is Jamie and this afternoon I'm going to be driving you around along with several other people to show you the different magical animals of the wildlife area in South Africa. And behind me sits a gentleman called Brian. Now Brian is quite camera shy but you'll have to behave really well and if you're really lucky you might even get to see a special character every now and again. Uh, we're going to say a big warm welcome to the thumb as well and today I believe the thumb is dressed up as a leopard. There you go. Here pops the thumb. Do you think it's going to bring us some luck and that we might spot one of the mystery cats of South Africa? That's who we're searching for at the moment. We're searching for a very special leopard. Her name is Shadow. And Shadow also has a baby with her. We're going to be keeping our fingers crossed. And since you are joining us for the first time and you're on a safari, what you're seeing is actually happening right here in real life, in the middle of a place called the Sabi Sand. And it's one of the most famous wildlife areas in South Africa. So if any of you have ever seen a documentary, with lions and elephants, there's a chance that it was filmed here because we just have such an extraordinary amount of wildlife. And somebody has been very busy here. Hmm, sometimes in the bush, you need to be a bit of a detective. So, shall we see if we can figure out what happened here and who's been around? Before I get out of the car, I'd better check and make sure that he isn't still around. But let's see if you can figure out which animals come walking down this road. And this is your first clue. I'm going to go and fetch it for you. <laughs> and for some reason, this animal has dragged it all along the road. I'm going to try and drag it back for you. Now that is very heavy but it wouldn't have been very heavy for the animal that was pulling it around to start with. So, we know it's something big and we know it's something that eats, oh, that eats leaves. What do you think might have done that? What would come through and break a branch of that size and then drag it into the road? Let's see if we can find some more evidence, some more clues to follow to figure out who is responsible. There we go, let me just plug myself back in so that I can get your questions. Hmm. Now, Brian 
Tegan has a special question from, for you. She wants to know, why is the thumb a leopard today? Why is the thumb a leopard today, Brian? Well, the thumb's a leopard to bring us the leopard luck. Yes. Hopefully to find Shadow or Karula, the main leopards in this area, as well as their cubs. Wouldn't that be spectacular? So there you go, Tegan. That is why the thumb is a leopard today. Now the thumb dresses up as something different every single day, but we're hoping that's going to cause, bring us some really, really good luck. Now while we continue on looking for whatever pulled the branch into the road, as well as for Shadow and Karula, the leopards, I think that one of the other guides has found you a centipede. Well, you know, it's one of my favorite things to have a look under all these stumps. And what we've done is we've picked up a stump and lo and behold, a centipede is busy lurking underneath there. Now centipedes get their name because centi, in I think Latin, <laughs> means a hundred and pedi is legs, so the hundred leg. And he hasn't quite got a hundred legs, this centipede, but you do, some, you do find some centipedes that are as long as my arm. Can you believe that? They hang, inside, they hang out inside caves, hanging from the roof, and they catch bats. This little guy, he doesn't catch bats. He's too small to catch a bat. But what he'd be looking for is crickets and grasshoppers and worms and anything that he can sink his little feelers and sink his little claws into. Now, believe it or not, centipedes are actually venomous. Right in the front of this centipede's body, just underneath its head, it has a pair of legs, right there, has a pair of legs that has been modified into a poison fang. Two of them in actual fact, sits just underneath his head. He's got a pair of legs that has changed into a fang and he can inject venom into whatever he catches. Look at that. Let's watch him hunt. Don't want him to bite me. See how quickly he moves. Incredibly fast little predators. There he is over there. And unlike a millipede, this guy is a carnivore. Now what carnivores mean is that it eats meat. The millipedes, they eat vegetables and fungus and they call detritivores or herbivores. All right, we're gonna quickly go over to another vehicle. They've got something a little bit more exciting for you. <laughs> We just don't know where to look here, everybody. There's a troop of mongoose, dwarf mongoose, and they're being accompanied, not unusually, by a little flock of yellow-billed hornbills. And it's quite an interesting, I wouldn't say necessarily symbiotic relationship, but it is, it is a, a, an interesting relationship where the hornbills play security guards to the little mongoose, and the little mongoose, I suppose, they dig up things, you know, that the, that the hornbills would want to eat and the hornbills will flap down and grab them and eat them and in so doing they've got a special relationship that allows them to live very happily together. Now the mongoose is looking for all sorts of little things like that centipede you just saw with Steph. The mongoose will happily eat those even though to us they are well they're quite scary centipedes. They can be, they can bite quite badly and they'll also eat things like eggs if they find the eggs of a bird that nests on the road or on the floor then they'll th they do a very clever thing actually what they do is that they throw the eggs between their legs onto a stone behind them and then they eat up the yolk and the albumen which is the egg white and the egg yellow and that's how they get the nutrition they eat all sorts of insects and different kinds of invertebrates and if they can they'll even eat little snakes believe it or not whereas the uh, the hornbills they eat similar sorts of things but they will eat uh, largely meaty type things. They won't eat eggs. They'll eat small lizards and reptiles and even chameleons. Now, my name's James, by the way, for those of you in the school, and Viam is on camera. So just before I thought I'd better introduce myself so that you know who I am, and you can ask me any questions you like. And one other thing I wanted to tell you about was the chameleon. And the chameleon, of course, I'm sure you've seen, and they get eaten by these enormous 
uh, well, not as enormous, by these very colourful hornbills. Now, there's a very, very good name in your classroom there, and that name, of course, is James. That is the best name in the classroom, and you want to know how many kinds of mongoose we get. James, we get the dwarf mongoose, which is only that big, that's the one we just saw. We get the banded mongoose, which is about that big, and that's got little stripes on it, that's why it's called banded. And then we get something called a slender mongoose, which is long and thin, like a sausage dog. Do you know what a sausage dog is, James? Looks like a little sausage dog with a very long tail, and it keeps low to the ground and scurries around, and they occur in little pairs, so in groups of one or two. Uh, and then we get a very special mongoose at night time called a white-tailed mongoose. And that's a big mongoose like that with a fluffy white tail. And it's possible that you might see something like a yellow mongoose here or a Miller's mongoose, but I've never seen one here before. So our plan, everybody, you haven't seen me yet, of course, until now, our plan is to head down towards where we did see a leopard. We hopefully we'll see it again. Evan, you want to know if humans can die from being bitten by a centipede? No, Evan, they can't. Not even a little human like you. It's just, it's like a bee sting, really, and I don't even think that you can be allergic to them like you can to a bee sting. It just doesn't feel very nice, and it can, in fact, some of them can hurt really badly, and they'll make your whole, say if you get bitten on the finger, they'll make your whole hand swell, and they'll make it go numb, and numb means when you can't feel anything but it won't kill you and eventually that pain will go away and you'll be absolutely fine. So that's what happens with the centipede. But they don't all do that. Hello Liana, you want to know the difference between a leopard and a cheetah. Well, I'm going to try and illustrate it to you. So you've seen Jamie, right? Jamie's thin and she's flexible, right? She used to be a ballerina, so she can do the splits like I'm sure many of you can, young girls. And then that's like a cheetah. Very fast but very flexible and uh, long muscles that are very flexible, not very big though. Then you've seen Steph on the walk. He was the one who found you the centipede. He's big and he's strong and he's very fast over a short distance, but he's not that flexible, uh, but he's very strong, and that's like a leopard. So those are the two differences, and those are the kind of obvious differences that you can see between them. The color is quite similar. They're both sort of yellow colored with black spots, but a leopard's spots are a bit different. A leopard's spots are what we call rosettes. And in fact, it's impossible for me to show you that. I'm going to have to show you a picture. And I got a new book, you know, when I was on holiday. I bought a very special book that's got all the pictures of the mammals. So what we'll do is find a picture for you of the leopard and the cheetah together. And then you won't be confused at all. Now, I've never used this book before, so I hope I can find the leopard and the cheetah. I should be able to, as I've been out in this area for a very long time. There we go. Right. There we go. There's the leopard over there. Um, <laughs> I must say, this is a very interesting, interesting book. I've never, there's the cheetah there. But that's the leopard, and you can see that his spots are in what we call rosettes. So it looks like a flower with a bit of gold in the middle and black around the outside. That's what the leopard spots look like. And then here's the cheetah. That's the cheetah there, and you can see just plain black spots. And it's much more slight. So like, that would be like Jamie, thin and very flexible. This would be like Steph, very big and strong and very fast over short distance. But this is a coursing hunter. It will run for long distance like a big greyhound dog. You know what a greyhound is? Very similar to that. Don't tell Jamie I compared her with a greyhound. She won't be happy with that at all. And Annika, that's a lovely name as well. Annika, you want to know how fast a leopard can run? Well, a leopard can run for a very short distance at about 80 kilometers an hour. Now, 80 kilometers an hour in miles is 50 miles per hour, so that's pretty quick. But a cheetah, of course, we know, can run at at least 60 kilometers an hour, at least 60 miles per hour, and they can keep up that speed for quite a long time. Longer than a leopard is able to keep up its 50 miles per hour. 
And the leopard, of course, is able to pull its prey up into a tree. It's big and strong, so it can pull them up into a tree, whereas a, a, a leopard cheetah can't do that. And Liz Marie, you want to know how many babies a leopard can have. Well, up to six, believe it or not, but normally two or three. The most I've seen is four, but out here, it's very seldom that a female leopard will be able to raise all four babies to independence or adulthood. So normally, if there are four born, two of them will probably die, and two is about the average. And this female leopard, our favorite female leopard, she's 12 years old, she's got two cubs at the moment, and they're just four months old. It's their birthday today, four months they've been alive. And in human years, you know what, four months sounds like, I mean, you know that a human baby of four months old is very tiny, only about that big. And when these leopards are born, they're probably the size of a rat, basically. And in four months, they're now that big. So they're bigger than a human baby at four months. And it's a bit the same, I suppose, as a human baby of about almost four years, I guess you would say. So it's that kind of age. So they age much more quickly than human beings do, and they develop much more quickly. So this is round about where the mother leopard came towards. So we're going to keep an eye out. And what we're going to look for are those black spots, because if you know what to look for, then you can see them. So just look around us here in all of the bushes underneath. She might be sleeping underneath. She might be in the top of a tree where she could have killed something and she'll be eating that, so it could be anywhere. While we look for the leopard, let's head across to Jamie. She's got some more mongoose. Don't tell her I called her a greyhound. I've also found some dwarf mongoose for you, and unfortunately, I just can't quite convince myself not to stop and have a look at them every time I see them. I just find them so incredibly interesting. They're really, really cute. Also, really smart little animals, constantly looking out for any predators. And also, they will warn each other if they do see a predator. Uh, Diana, you were wondering, what are the main predators of a dwarf mongoose? One of its biggest predators is a bird of prey. So anything from an eagle, even a goshawk or something small like that is able to catch a dwarf mongoose. Snakes as well, some of the biggest snake species, although a snake that picks a fight with a dwarf mongoose has to be prepared to deal with its whole family coming to help it out. And then, every now and again, some of the smaller cats, serval, caracal, fascinating little cats that we hardly ever get to see. They're probably about double the size of your cats at home and very, very good at hunting small prey. Dwarf mongoose are small. They're only about, if you stretch out your arm, your from the end of your fingers to your elbow, if you all stretch out your arm and just picture something like that, a dwarf mongoose is about half that size. So it's really, really small. Audrey, you were wondering, on the subject of tiny things, how many babies a dwarf mongoose can have. Between two to six is the average out here. So anywhere from two and sometimes four, but usually between two to six. And the fascinating thing about the dwarf mongoose babies is that the whole family will band together and look after them. And since they have run away, and since it's still nice and warm on our winter's afternoon, we're going to go and check the closest water hole. Let's see what's having a drink there. All dashed away gone off hiding and looking for various insects. Just like, how many of you have ever heard of or seen a ferret? Alexander, you were wondering what family a dwarf mongoose is related to. And the answer is sort of, they're kind of like the South African equivalent of a ferret. Not like a weasel or a skunk. Those are a separate family, although they are related to each other. But how many of you have watched The Lion King? and seen Timon. Now, Timon was part of the family of the mongoose. He is a meerkat or a Suri cat is one of their other names that they are nicknamed. And they all belong, if you want to get really scientific about it, 
They all belong to a family called the Herpestidae family, which kind of sounds like they're pests, but it isn't at all. They are the Herpestidae family. While we go and investigate the local water hole, James has found an antelope that really, really likes water. There's a water buck, everybody. <laughs> there was a water buck, everybody. It's gone walking off into the thick bush where I'm afraid we can't follow it. Oh, there's another one. Same place. They occur in herds, obviously. They like to live in groups. And a water buck is one of the nicest smelling animals out here. It smells like sort of old comforting leather, if you like. I don't know if you've ever smelt old comforting leather, but maybe you've got grandparents who've got a leather sofa, or perhaps you've ridden a horse and you've seen an old saddle. That's basically what they smell like. And I think it's a really nice smell. And there's an impala. That's a male impala. That's the most common antelope we get here. Waterbuck is also an antelope, but a different kind. And we get nine different kinds of antelopes in this area. And when you finish your drive, I tell you what, why don't you ask your teacher to help you find out which nine antelope we get here. I'm going to give you seven of them and you can figure out the other two. So you've seen an impala there. You know we get waterbuck. You've heard of wildebeest, I'm sure. Then we get nyala and kudu and we get bushbuck and we get... Uh, I know that I want you to find out about the two little ones. They're two very small ones that we get here as well. Now, what else am I missing out here? Hmm? I wasn't listening to the first no. one, so I don't Okay. All right. Well, there are two little ones, one grey and one uh, brown, which are very beautiful, and you need to try and find out what those are. Ask your teacher, and she will, I'm sure, be able to help you find them out. Right. Jamie's got something that isn't an antelope, but is very closely related. For the last few moments of the safari for Kempsville, Element or Kempsville Meadows Elementary, we have some buffalo to show you, resting up in the afternoon sun and just enjoying the last few rays of light before it gets a bit cooler and they have to start worrying about the lions that will be wandering through. These are all buffalo males or buffalo bulls. One of them is sharing the water hole with a zebra as well. So we've got basically Africa's equivalent of the horse in the form of a zebra and a buffalo, which kind of looks like a cow, but definitely shouldn't be confused with one. And these bachelor buffalo form groups together with other males. Now apparently, Max, you were wondering if perhaps we started off our drive with trying to figure out what animal knocked down that tree and you were wondering if it, is, as if it was a zebra. And Max, no, it's not. It wasn't a zebra. A zebra is not quite strong enough to do that. Now, I did go looking for the animal that pulled that tree down, and, but since I didn't find it, I'll tell you the answer to our puzzle, and that it was an elephant. A big male elephant walked through that area and pulled that branch away from the rest of the tree, dragged it into the middle of the road, and had a little bit of a snack on it. Now, that is what pulled that branch right into the middle of the road. Well, kids, we've come to the end of your safari experience. I hope you enjoyed it and that you have a wonderful rest of your school day. And hopefully we get to see you again once again on safari. You never know, you might make an appearance. Bye-bye and have a wonderful day further. Back to our regular viewers. Hello. We are still here and we're hoping you are still with us. Now, if you remember, in my last few shows, we have been practicing advert breaks. Now, what that means is every now and again, we're going to tell you that we are going away, but we're not going away. We're not going anywhere. There are no ad breaks on the internet. It's just that we're practicing for the upcoming television appearances. So that's why every now and again, we say, welcome back, or we say, um, we do a recap, or we'll say that we'll see you out of the break. Don't panic. We're not going anywhere, and we're certainly not finishing early. We're just 
change, we're just practicing to make sure that we get it right when we need to. We've got a really pleasant scene here around the Juma waterhole. Oh, somebody's a bit cross. What was that all about? <laughs> Thought about chasing that zebra there. He is not in a very good mood. Two buffalo bulls are squaring up against each other. Will they fight or will they not? You'll have to stay tuned and see after the break. And of course, for those of you watching on the internet, you don't have to wait for the break. And in fact, none of you have to wait for the break because that's not quite how this works. I do find myself being highly entertained when I say that and things don't necessarily work out that way. Will they fight or won't they fight? No, but the zebra, sorry, the zebra got a little bit of a fright there. He just cantered his way past. Oh. Tyler, you are nine years old and you wanted to know if horses and zebra are related and the answer is absolutely yes, they are related. And they're very, very similar in that their hoof structure is exactly the same and their digestive tract, so the way that they digest grass is also the same. But Tyler, the one thing that zebra are very, very different to horses is the fact that their backs are absolutely not strong enough to hold people. If people cannot ride zebra, and in fact cannot tame zebra. Tame zebra, I have encountered one or two in my life, and I say tame very loosely, because I've been bitten by several in my time. It is not a good idea to keep a zebra as a pet. They're very strong, and they bite exceptionally hard, speaking from experience. A zebra is kind of like a stripy horse, but not to be confused with one. Our buffalo bulls are still grunting at each other. They're not really doing anything. They're just mooing every now and again. I don't know what kind of argument they had. Maybe a disagreement as to what sports team they support or something along those lines. Obviously not. It is a personality clash of sorts, especially since as water becomes more and more contested, the tempers of all of the larger animals become quite short, and they prove to be quite particularly buffalo and elephant, quite irascible around the waterhole, kind of picking fights with whoever and whatever they can. Oh. And I think the troublemaker is the buffalo at the back. I think he's causing the issues because so far he's picked a, a minor confrontation with two buffalo while I've been watching. Don't know what his problem is. He's having a grumpy horn day or something. But he's the one causing all of the disruption. In the meantime, one buffalo has acquired every single ox picker. It's always amazing how that happens. Most of the buffalo have hardly any, in some cases none. Oh, I was about to say that buffalo has acquired all of them, but they, half of them then promptly flew off as I was about to start that sentence and made their way to greener pastures, or in this case, more tick-filled pastures. And welcome back to those of you who never left. Uh, of course, you were waiting in eager anticipation to find out while you were away whether or not the buffalo bulls ever did come to blows. And they haven't. They grunted at each other for a while and then moved off in their separate ways. And obviously, the buffalo not really wanting to cause too much trouble, but just expressing their discomfort with each other in such a close proximity. Now, if you have any questions about buffalo or any of the other magnificent beasts that we get to see out here, or indeed the magnificent flora or birds or anything else, you can send those through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter 
or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. And as I said at the start of the Sunset Safari, let us try and get a fantastic conversation going about all of these phenomenal animals. And Chitra, welcome once again on the back of the Sunset Safari. With our grumpy buffalo, you were wondering if buffalo are territorial. The answer is no, they're not. They're not in any way territorial, neither the bachelor boys nor the enormous breeding herds of up to 500,000 buffalo of different ages and sexes. They are in no way competitive over a particular area, but they can be competitive over space and access to water and so on. Well, breeding herds usually quite happily share and everybody takes their turn when getting to the waterhole. There might be some jostling, but other than that it's relatively peacefully managed. These buffalo boys, the Dugger boys as they are known, they have a slightly more impatient temperament and occasionally don't want to share, especially when somebody else is very much in their personal space. So they can butt heads quite literally over space and water but the only time that they will really have a serious confrontation is over a female in estrus, a female that's ready to mate and that applies to almost every animal out here. They will compete in some way for the opportunity to pass on their genetics. They might not be territorial but a big herd of buffalo needs to be very careful in terms of where they go and how they eat. So you can imagine one buffalo munching away on the grass and walking on the grass might not have a tremendous impact, but a thousand buffalo, and this gentleman could be close to just under a ton in weight, imagine a thousand ton buffalo all wandering through an area, just imagine the effect that that has on the grass and the soil. Now this environment has evolved to deal with that, but not in an overcrowding situation. The buffalo have to rotate around places where they go and they feed to make sure that the grass and the soil has time to recover from their, the impact that they have had. You can already see as this buffalo lay down the clouds of dust billowing up and that's due to the fact that there is hardly any grass cover left. In this area in particular shall be hard hit because of course it's right next to the water. It's right next to some of the only water that is going to be left here by the time we reach the end of our dry season. Animals will be congregating between hoof action and over grazing. It will have a serious impact. We stop and we look at ox pickers on buffalo all the time. And Deborah, you were wondering whether or not the ox pickers will ever feed anywhere else apart from on the backs of animals? That is a really good question because I have seen them hop around on the ground every now and again but hardly ever picking up food. They are a very very specialized species and whilst I think that they could probably survive without or at least temporarily survive without any animals to sit on and to pick ticks off, I don't think that they would be very successful at all. So an example of a mutually beneficial relationship in most circumstances and in fact a relationship that is necessary for the animal's survival. Very much perfectly constructed to feed off the animals that they do from their comb-like bills to the stiffened tail feathers that hold them on the bodies of the animals. Right, we are going to go and see if we can't find shadow as the evening starts to get a little bit cooler. However, James has got a wonderful surprise for you. What we have there, everybody, is a jackalberry tree on the way to Cheetah Plains. Now, a jackalberry tree in and of itself is quite an attractive thing, of course, but it is made infinitely more attractive by what one might find lying in the shady boughs of a jackalberry tree. And there is Tundi, daughter of Karula, sister of Shadow, and either 
very fat from a vast meal or quite possibly pregnant. She would be about to give birth if I'm not mistaken. Probably no, not just yet, maybe a month or so. She was mating with Tingana some time back and there she is. Isn't that wonderful? She's resting in sweet repose. I'm just scanning the rest of the tree to see if I can't... I can't believe this. Just to see if I can find, sorry, a any sign of a kill, but I don't see any sign of a kill there. Now this is very embarrassing everybody, but I have to confess to you that it isn't a jackalberry tree, is it, Viam? No. no. It's a tamburti tree, isn't it? It does look like a tamburti. It is a tamburti tree. So if you could just go back to the introduction that I did there and um, replace all references to a jackalberry tree with tamburti. Right, okay, thank you. There, everybody, is a tamburti tree. Now, in and of itself, a tamburti tree is not necessarily that entertaining, but lying in the shady boughs of the tamburti tree is a leopard. That's Tundi. Daughter of Karula and sister of Shadow. And get heir to, heir to Juma? And heir to the Juma, what, lands, domain, kingdom. So we're on the way to Cheetah Plains and we came across Shanae Wiles Bailey of New Zealand, ex-South Africa. And she, of course, is guiding it in Koro and she said, well, your afternoon is about to improve immeasurably and so it has. And as I was saying, she does look very fat indeed. I'm a bit sad that our school kids have left us. I think they would really have enjoyed seeing this leopard. Anyway, please do send through your questions, everyone. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv or just your comments. So Tundi, being Shadow's litter mate and sister, is nine years old. And I'd love to know actually when her birthday is. I'm sure one of our leopard experts will tell us. But she must be closing in on 10, I would have thought. That's very special to see. The reason I got confused, I know that uh, while we're looking at the leopard, the tree is secondary, but the reason I was confused by it is that it's so very big and it's so big because of course it's growing on a termite mound which is full of aerated soil and lots of nutrients from the termite dung that has been deposited therein. Oh dear, and it seems as though James has lost his signal. That's why he disappeared off in mid-sentence. It's the trickiest possible place that he could be, right in the drip of a drop, right in the dip of a riverbed. There we go. The words came out eventually. And it's one of the riskiest spots in terms of signal. As you can imagine, we're bringing you a live safari from the center of the African bush. Sometimes things don't go exactly according to plan. Luckily for you, you've arrived at the right time because we're heading straight back to where we last had Shadow's tracks. And Brent has just given me a call on the radio to say that he's found fresh tracks that were not there this morning when he went looking for her. Isn't it wonderful that Shadow's decided to move back into this area? Also, as you can see, the chill is already setting in. We're shivering ever so slightly. Uh, we're going to go, I've just realized I've already checked this road, so we're going to go another way and see if we can't figure out exactly where this leopard is. Let's go check the western edge of the quarantine. A really 
nice question from Cindy in North Carolina as the weather starts to get a bit chilly. You were wondering where the monitor lizards are and if they hibernate during the winter. Now, I've seen, Cindy, funnily enough, I've actually seen in the last few days so many tracks of monitor lizards, but I can't figure out exactly where it is they're hiding. Now, they are very well adapted to living in the crevices of rocks and drainage lines, up even in tree holes in hollowed out stumps. Uh, it's not that they hibernate at all. They can go into a form of torpor called estivation, which is what a lot of our reptiles do when it gets dry, when we go into our dry season, rather than hibernation, which is as a result of a drop in temperature. However, like quite a few of the larger reptile species, legavans or rock monitors or Nile monitors, water monitor lizards, they actually don't do that all that often. So kind of like the crocodiles, they're quite large and they can sustain themselves throughout the dry period and throughout the cooler periods out here as well. Uh, I'm not sure where they're all hiding though, Cindy. We'll have to keep an eye out. I'm trying to think. I think there was a sighting recently, but I'm not 100% sure that that is the case. Just trying to remember. Okay, Shadow. Imagine if we got Shadow, Karula and Tundi all in one afternoon. Wouldn't that be incredible? A mother and her twin daughters. Now, the last time I saw Tundi was not too far. In fact, where we turned around, that's exactly where I last saw Tundi and she was busy mating with Tangana. Apparently, Jane says she's looking either very full or quite possibly pregnant. Now, I'm just trying to do the maths quickly. When was Tundi mating with Tangana? You know, it might be exactly right. So, where are we? So, Genevieve, New York, you sent through the update that we last saw the mating on the 19th of February. Now, if I remember correctly, we've just gone into the 1st of June. So we've got March, April, May, and the 1st of June. That would be pretty much spot on for a slightly late pregnancy. The leopards, depending, of course, on the individual, just like it differs with human beings, leopards can have a gestation period from around 95 to around 105 days. So just over three months, that would put it perfectly right now she's probably or she could well be looking for a den site for her cubs and the wonderful thing I actually saw Tundi a couple of days ago but I didn't realize it was her because we had such a, a difficult view again Tundi seems to pick black the black holes for signal but she was right in the drainage line underneath Cheetah Plains Lodge in fact right outside one of their guest rooms and I didn't see her properly all I saw was as I drove in, she was sort of on the side of the vehicle down in the dip. I couldn't get a good view. I thought it was Inkanyeni that we were looking at, but apparently it was Tundi. And she was looking particularly rotund from what I could see. Oh, oh. caught out by a hyena track. Just keeping fingers crossed that it was a leopard. So Brent's asked me to check Zoe's road. So that is where we're heading to see if Shadow didn't pop out somewhere there. We know at this point, having been following her for the last year, and I know some of you have been following their stories for much, much longer, but from a personal perspective of having followed these leopards for a year now, we do get a very good idea of the routes that they often like to walk. Where did you go? Is there still one there? Oh, there he's hiding. <laughs> I see you. Unfortunately, it's right, obviously, facing straight west. There he is at the top there in the center of your screen. A vervet monkey. And I'm not sure who was taken more surprise there, myself or the monkey, as we came dashing round opposite sides of a termite mound and encountered each other. 
Let's try and look at it from a different perspective, just because this angle is really, really difficult, straight into the sun. And now that it has settled in a marula tree, we're going to loop around and see if we can't get another view. Monkey's looking at me, kind of doing that very, very typical vervet monkey dance when they're curious about something. Oh, hold on. Somebody's making a run for it. <laughs> I think it wants to find the rest of its troop. Off it <laughs> Hop. T looking desperately around for the rest of its family. Decided that we were not too much of a threat, so it decided it was worth the risk coming down to the ground and heading off in search of them. Well, monkeys are one of the most reliable alert systems out here. They have exceptionally good eyesight and they do keep a very close eye out for a number of big cats. Peekaboo, we still see you there. I think let's go and investigate, see if the rest of the vervet monkey troop isn't just around this corner. <laughs> it's very funny, this is the expression. Primates have such humanly expressive faces. And of course, you've always got to be careful not to anthropomorphize them too much, but it is very easy to do with a primate. Where are you going to go? I just see flashes of movement of little grey animals every now and again. Uh -huh. There's one view. Let us try and get a different view. Most of them have moved off towards a large marula tree and a termite mound. If I go any closer, they're going to dash off. There you go. Now they feel that they're at a safe distance and also the one that we were looking at feels more comfortable now that it has the protection of the rest of the group. Very common to see vervet monkeys foraging on the ground but they do feel naturally much safer up in a tree. And that makes total sense. They're more agile than almost anything out here tree tends to be a safer refuge than the ground does. Not always the case though, especially if there is a circling martial eagle, another bird of prey, will be far more on the lookout and definitely looking for places on the ground to hide. But as herbivores, and they are almost totally herbivorous, they might chew on a piece of meat every now and again, maybe even pick up an insect or a tick, but the main portion of their diet consists of various plant shoots and leaves, berries, different types of fruit, and even the rhizomes and the hyphae. Oh, <laughs> that was so cute. It was chasing a butterfly. Oh, I think it might have caught it, you know. Having me just discussing their diet and talking about the plant species that they eat, that monkey promptly set out to prove that animals don't read the textbooks and therefore don't always do what you expect them to. And you know, I think that monkey really did manage to clutch that butterfly in its hand and then it ran off behind the termite mound to munch on it. <laughs> That's a first for me on these live safaris. They came to pay us a visit this morning, hanging around the campsite, investigating, trying to see whether we had been remiss in closing the storeroom door. Well, trust me when I say that the last thing you want is a troop of monkeys getting into wherever you store your food, or indeed a troop of baboons, which can be equally bad, and they tend to be a bit more noxious smelling. But a troop of monkeys is bad enough, they tend to be exceptionally destructive and very, very good at getting into anything they want to have. 
Uh, unfortunately, it seems as though James has had to leave Tundi in order to find a place where he has some signal. However, he's moved on to Cheetah Plains, so let's find out what is happening there. Right, well, we are on Cheetah Plains. I'm afraid, like Jamie said, we had to leave Tundi reclining in her tree there because of the signal. Um, sorry about that. But it is in a, well, I mean, that's not really even our traversing area, but we were just very lucky to see her. We're heading towards three in a row pan, which I believe they've started pumping again. So we'll just see if there isn't anything there. Then I want to go back up this road towards the northern side of the clearings, and we'll work our way south from there towards the Mala Mala boundary. There are some impala. It's a good start, isn't it, Viam? Two young males. Next year, of course, these two chaps are going to have a lot of testosterone coursing through their bodies. And they won't be nearly so friendly. Then that marula tree, that's the one there, that's it, Viam, is covered in the parasitic mistletoe. You can see all of the dark bits there, all of those kind of thick, dense bits of the leaves there are mistletoe plants, and some of them are enormous. It's quite interesting, actually. And there was a fear that these mistletoe plants were killing off the marulas. And one of the guys down, who I, I met down at Londolozi a little while back, said, you watch these mistletoes. The trees on which the mistletoes are growing are losing limbs. So they, basically what he was saying is that where you get a big mistletoe like that, the limb, the tree will sacrifice the limb and drop it off which I think is quite interesting. I haven't seen that happen here, though. Anyway, that's part of the, you know, the politics of plants, BM. Sounds like a good, uh, good title for a film, don't you think? Absolutely. The politics of plants. Very nice, yes. It sounds boring, though. It does sound unbelievably boring, I have to agree. It's not something I would choose to watch, no. A couple of elephant tracks going down the road. So maybe there is some water in the pan. I've yet to see this pan with water in it since we've been at Cheetah Plains. Although, no, that's not true. When we started, there was a little bit left. Maybe Quarantine will be lying in his favorite marula tree. No, he isn't. I don't see him there. also don't see much in the way of water. No. No water yet. I'm sure they will start to pump them fairly soon. <laughs> Hello, Gracie. <laughs> You say you missed me very much while I was gone and that you had bad dreams about elephants. Gracie, I'm sorry you had bad dreams about elephants. And I did miss you. Of course I missed you, Gracie. Who else was I going to talk to in the afternoons? I'm very glad that you're back and talking to me. I thought maybe you'd forgotten about me, you know. But now I'm very pleased that you haven't. And uh, we can continue our conversations. And I hope that you have no more bad dreams about elephants. There is a little bit of water in this pan, uh, not particularly picturesque at the moment, given that it's obviously been scooped out in preparation for some pumping. I'm going to turn around here, like I said. No, I'm not. I'm going to carry on straight. Because there's an elephant around the corner. <laughs> He's looking at us. He is a vast bull. I'll just assess him. You see how I swung his leg there? He's just indicating that he's not quite comfortable. A little bit further forward. He's hiding in the bush there. We've 
not going to go off road, so I'm just going to be a little bit slow about approaching him. He did give us a bit of a, a look out of the side of his head. Ooh, he's about to have a big dump for him. So we're just going to stop here, let him get comfortable with us. That bubbling noise you can hear is uh, gas coming out of him. Natasha, you're in Ontario. I haven't heard from you for a while, so thank you for your question. You want to know if this fellow, if his toenails will keep growing until he dies in the same way that we do, our toenails do. Um, yes, I, you know, I imagine they would. I don't see why they wouldn't, but you know, very few elephants actually manage to maintain their toenails at all. They normally kick them off. And it's often only captive elephants that manage to keep their toenails. Because these guys kick rocks and they use their feet, of course, to pick roots and pick branches off of the ground. And so I think often their toenails just get knocked off by doing that. He's a big fellow, this. He's going to cruise gently towards him. He's not very happy to see us. A little bit nervous of us. He's been drinking at that pan. You can maybe see that he's got some sort of moisture on the bottom end of his trunk there. Of course, the fact that Rusty sounds like a locomotive is not particularly helpful to the elephant's comfort. There, yeah, that's much more peaceful now. He's huge, you know. He's probably about 30 years old, maybe 35, standing about 10 feet at the shoulder. He's probably about five tons, 5,000 kilograms, or 10,000, or 11,000 pounds. So just roll forward gently. Now, well, like I say, we can't follow him off-road, I'm afraid. So I think given that he's a little uncomfortable, we'll just watch him disappear off into the bush there. Not sure why he should be uncomfortable. You know, he's a big, un he's a big confident bull. Well, he's not confident, but he's a big bull. He's got nothing to worry about. But elephants, much like human beings, well, I think all animals, but elephants, it's obvious. They all have very different personalities and they go through different sort of mood swings and they can be happy one day and they can be depressed and sad on other days, I think. You know, maybe he just wants to be left alone. Hmm. Very lovely afternoon here on Cheetah Plains. It's still warm. The sun, of course, is now heading towards the horizon, but it's by no means co cold at all. It's a very pleasant temperature, and the light is just turning that perfect golden afternoon colour. I'm going to give him a few more minutes and just see if he doesn't come out into the open. But I don't think he's going to. I think he's going to disappear off into the bush. Yeah, there he goes. Bye-bye, old fella. Cool. Righty, let us continue on our way. Keep an eye out for tracks. Brent did have tracks of quarantine around here the other day. Quarantine, of course, a three-year-old male leopard. Hello, Joe in England. Uh, Joe, very nice question. Why are we not seeing catfish in the ponds anymore, in the pans? Joe, I think it's a function of the fact that, remember, all of the pans dried out, every single one of them, including Bivol's Hook Dam. Now, their eggs will be on the vegetation that grows and they'll be in the mud, and indeed a few of the adult catfish will be under the mud in a sort of, um, uh, well, they, they, they've got a sort of slimy sheath that they put over themselves. But I think what you'll find is that once the water falls and it does fill up the dams a bit, it takes a bit of time. And maybe those adults were all dead and maybe there weren't any adults, but it will take a bit of time for the youngsters to grow, to become that huge size that we see. 
Um, if they don't attain that big size, they get picked off before we even notice them. So, I mean, a catfish that big is going to be picked off by a heron or any number of other birds of prey. And that's why we're not seeing them, those sort of swirling, bubbling masses of catfish in the water holes. I suspect that if Buffalo's Hook dries down and gets smaller and smaller, it would have been a water body that, um, you know, for a sufficient length of time for the catfish to have got to a decent size. But because, remember, Treehouse Dam and Twin Dams and Juma Dam, they all dried out and then they got a little bit of water and then they kind of dried out again. I think you'll find that there wasn't sufficient time for the little catfish to become big catfish. Let's see what happens at Buffalo's Hook Dam, though. It will be interesting to see. But that would be my guess, Joe. Just look around us here. You'll see if you're a grazer, if you are a grass-eating animal, this we're headed for lean times. There isn't a blade of grass on this clearing. It's interesting. Now, I think that's a function of the fact that that pan, three in a row pan, of course, was pumped during the drought. And it's one of the reasons, of course, that we talk about, or we debate whether it's a good idea to put water holes, artificial water holes in these reserves or why it isn't. So we're quite close to there which means it would have attracted herds of buffalo and I know herds of buffalo came through this area and basically the you know when you have a central gathering point like that water hole the grazing all around it uh, will be denuded and it will continue to be denuded further and further away uh, depending on how how much rain you have and obviously the, that pan was one of the only bits of water during the last drought and it's denuded a lot of the grazing totally normal that that should happen but it does mean that we're in for a difficult time here all right let's head into the clearings here we'll find out what's going and why we're we doing that let's get out, out to Jamie and find out what she's found I hear that James has been chatting a bit about grazing and the dry season well, I've just had to duck around a buffalo thorn tree that the elephants have pushed into the road and there's a huge amount of elephant destruction around at the moment. They're relying very, very heavily on the trees. And the trees, of course, are what is going to get a lot of these amazing animals through the next few months. With their root system and their access to water, they're going to be absolutely essential. What we're doing, unfortunately, the elephants, as they've been through this area, have made tracking exceptionally difficult. Brent is still out searching for any sign of shadow. We're starting to run out of light. We've got to hope that we get her in the next few minutes, maybe in the next half an hour or so before the sun goes down. Because as you know, if we do see her and she has her cub with her, we absolutely cannot spotlight her. And the reason I'm bringing this up now is we had such clear evidence with that yesterday on the sunset safari. Now yesterday we had Tingana for the first time in ages, a spectacular view of him up in a marula tree with the setting sun and there were a couple of alarm calls from Impala and the next thing a hyena came trotting onto the scene. Now for a big male leopard like Tingana, one hyena is not really a threat, particularly when, you are, when he was reclined up right out of its reach but of course for a mother a female leopard like shadow with a new cub she wants to keep it as far away as possible from any hyenas and we don't want to add to that and hyena do occasionally follow spotlights and they do occasionally follow vehicles at night to see what they're up to particularly if they've been brought into the area by alarm calls and what's the first thing an impala does when it sees a leopard it starts to bark and that's two days in a row, actually, we've seen hyena following alarm calls. So that's why we won't be spotlighting her. If we do happen to find her, and I'm really hoping that we will, because Brent City had fresh, fresh tracks from somewhere just before the start of the sunset safari. And I'm sure that she's in this region. I've come a little bit far east for her territory, but you never know. I've yet to work out, well, we've yet to see Shadow's new cub, so we have no idea if it is a male or a female. But that brings up two questions. How 
others and be dependent upon them. The reason that I say that the sex of the cub matters is because Chitra, it depends on whether it's a male or a female, how long it stays with mom. Uh, it's actually, interestingly enough, the males that stay with their mothers a little bit longer. You're looking at around a year and a half to two years for a female, whereas male leopard cubs have been recorded to stay with their mothers up to close to two and a half years at times. That, of course, is dependent on whether or not she goes back into estrus and whether she mates and falls pregnant again in that time. Because she's not going to care for her leopard cub once she has a new set of cubs. She might tolerate it in her vicinity. She might not be aggressive. Hmm. I have found something interesting in the bush. Uh, let me jump out very quickly and just grab it so I can show you and then we shall be searching for its owner. Somebody has very chilly fingers. <laughs> so while I search for the owner of the lost glove, let's head across to James who's having some extraordinary luck this afternoon. Well, I've got to tell you, everybody, it's not often that the universe doth smile upon me as it is smiling upon... There are wild dogs up ahead. My goodness, there's a leopard there. There are wild dogs up ahead. Can you believe this? The zebra's being chased by wild dogs. <laughs> Look at this. There's the leopard. I've lost the leopard. Can you see the leopard? Yeah. Well, still trying to figure out what's going on here. Oh, there it is, the leopard. Okay, I can see the leopard. Let's just go up here. This is unbelievable. <laughs> I think we'll stay here with the dogs for a while. I'm going to have to call this in, everybody, and that is going to result in mayhem. I'm just warning you. Stations located pack of three wild dogs at Cheetah Plains Pan. Also female leopard in a tree at the same location. This is unbelievable. And no one's heard me call that in, I don't think. Oh, wow. Okay, so let's just enjoy. Now, these, this is three dogs, so it must be our pack, our little Investec pack, and the female is supposed to be, the alpha is supposed to be pregnant. Well, neither of that lot are pregnant. One's male, obviously. Now, zebra, of course, can sometimes fall prey to big packs of dogs, but they won't fall prey to very small packs like this. I'm just going to try and get sight of the female of the other one and see if she, it is the female and if she is pregnant. Here she comes. Oh, this is just wonderful. Isn't that beautiful? No, that's not pregnant. That's male. So I'm not sure who this lot is. Oh, this is too wonderful for words. Let's just reverse back, everyone, and savour this moment. We will come back to the leopard, I promise. I'm just going to call it in again. I can't hear anybody. Stations, I don't know if anyone's copied this, but I cannot copy anybody if you're trying to respond. Um, three dogs at Cheetah Plains Pan, like I said, and... A female leopard in a tree in the same place. Um, once you're within 400 meters, I will be able to copy you if you want to respond. This is wonderful. Let me move around. Sorry, let me just move around a bit so we can get a better view of them having a drink, if they're going to have a drink. <laughs> It doesn't rain, it pours.
Now you see, they are nervous, and they're nervous of crocodiles. They don't know if there are any crocodiles here or not, but they're definitely nervous of crocodiles, so while I'm sure they do want to have a drink, they're probably quite nervous of them. I'm just going to ask Kirsty uh, to ask Jamie to call this in for Andrew and Mike. Of course, they, I think, are on Torchwood. They're at Cheetah Plains Pan, and I'm just going to ask her to tell Jamie to tell them. We'll take a quick picula. Marvellous. See, looking in the water. I definitely think there's an element here of them being worried about a crocodile. Oh, this is fantastic. And Barbara, you want to know if they swim. Yeah, they're very adept swimmers. They're good swimmers, just like a sort of domestic dog is a good swimmer. But obviously, these chaps are not that keen on a swim right now. It is a bit cold, isn't it, Vian? Yep. Oh, this is so special. Kat, I'm afraid I haven't heard your question. The comms with the final control are not fantastic here. Kirsty, can you try it again? You say the males have beards on their necks, Kat. Yes, they do a bit, don't they? They do, but I think the females do as well, you know. I don't think it's only the males. All right, here we go. They seem to be getting mobile now. So we might have a bit of a chase on our hands, but that's okay. Let's follow them. If you're happy, everybody, we're going to follow them and we'll leave the leopard for now, who seemed to be very happily asleep in the tree. I can still see her. She's absolutely still there. So let's follow these dogs and they're going across a clearing, which of course is wonderful. Now, we've got the super zoom on the camera, everyone. So I'm going to get in front of them a little bit and then turn off because I think that they use their hearing quite a lot and I'm therefore going to try and keep my distance from them a little bit. Let's give a VM a chance to actually take a decent picture of them running. Isn't that lovely? Look at their mottled fur going into the woodland there. I think quite difficult to follow them through there. We're obviously going to try. I don't think I can get through that drainage. We're going to have to go down through here, everyone. What an afternoon! Two leopards, dogs, and a grey heron. Remember the grey heron we had, Viam? Yep. That was a highlight. That was a highlight. Well, there's another big clearing up here. Angel lady, you say two leopards, wild dogs, and you'd like to see a pangolin as well. I think you might be pushing it, but who knows? VMP, any ideas? It's not very thick through here. But it is quite thick through here. You got them? No, no, I think it's to the right. To the right, in the drainage. Okay, hold on, everyone. You might just see a flash of them disappearing through here. So, this is where they came in. We don't see them again here, 
We'll nip around to the other side and see if we can't catch them going through the clearings. Hear the bird's alarm calling. Let's just turn off slightly and have a quick listen. Yeah, I can't have, I think they've probably gone off in here. I'm going to suggest we go around to the other side and then we'll go back to the leopard if we don't see them. We're very close to the Nkoro uh, boundary here. I'm going to drive a little bit quicker. But we'll be in the clearing so it won't be too bumpy. Hello Elaine, nice question. You want to know if they bark like regular dogs? Uh, they don't. They can make a barking noise. They can go sort of oh, once, a bit like a kudu, I suppose. Um, but normally they don't. Normally they twitter and they sort of uh, chatter loudly. But if they are very alarmed, then they might bark. But only once, kind of an alarm bark. I don't know where these guys have gone. They've gone into this very thick stuff there. Now you see that's the danger of course of giving them a bit of distance is that they will disappear very quickly if you're not careful. I can't believe how the greenery has disappeared from here. Right, so they were coming down in this direction. Uh, I can't hear them. Well, obviously I can't hear them, but I can't hear anything alarm calling. I'm reticent to go bashing in there after them, everyone. It is just the three of them and they will be pretty much on the hunt now as the sun starts to set. What do you think, Viam? Back or forward? Uh, I think we go back. I think we do too. Although, you got them. Yep. <laughs> They move quickly. There they go. They're going on to Nkoro, everybody. There are two there to the right of us, one in front. Oh, this is brilliant. There they go. Well spotted, Vimpi. And that, I'm afraid, is it, everybody. They're going on to Nkoro now. And as far as I know, all the Nkoro rangers are looking at lions on Hoffmans. Brilliant. That's not bad going, is it, Viam? Do you want to see a leopard? Yes, please. Should we go see a leopard? Let's go see a leopard. Yes. I mean, I'm guessing in Kanyeni from the golden colour, but might not be. Our beard, I guess, I think I, if I heard correctly, you want to know if a leopard would kill a wild dog. Uh, yes, they would. And certainly leopards would kill uh, young wild dogs. Pups, what do you got there? Vultures. Vultures. Off, yeah. uh, off the ground? Yeah, but Okay, let's carry on to the leopard. It's too much going on here, everybody. Uh, yes, they would. And certainly wild dogs, if a leopard comes anywhere near the den when they've got pups, uh, they go ballistic, they go crazy. And leopards really have to watch out. Because although they're much bigger, of course, wild dogs in a pack are a great danger to leopards. Okay, here we go. Um, Peter, I can just copy you. We did have a, the actual animals of the, the pack. They've now headed north into Nkoro 
just to the, I think it's uh, to the east of what you call Carl Hall. Uh, the leopard is still in the tree. We think we're going back towards that position now. Sorry, I'm losing you, Peter. Um, they just crossed now into Nkoro. All right, let's quickly go across to Jamie and get an update from her while I deal with the radio. Well, James heads back to Inkanyeni, slowly racking up the number of people who have seen Inkanyeni, whilst I haven't. I've returned to take up his vigil at the spot where Karula with her cubs was this morning. Just in the hope that she might be moving about now as it starts to get dark. And Susie? You wanted an update on Karula and wondering whether or not she's been about. She was seen here this morning with both cubs happy, healthy and playing about. Uh, Karula once again proving her incredible skills at mothering. Not the easiest job for a female leopard, but somehow Karula has a way of getting things right. She also has a way of disappearing. I just want to stop just so I can double, triple check that she's not somewhere in here. You know how difficult it can be to spot a leopard when they don't move. It doesn't look as though she is going to come out. She might have moved further into Little Gowrie. I think that's probably what she's done. I heard some birds alarm calling a little bit further in and that could well be at her as she moves her cubs a bit deeper in. She's returned them exactly to the spot where she first, one of the first places that she chose to den them on, which for us was a very strange decision because this is, this is a main road, it's a main access route, and yet both Shadow and Karula both decided to keep their cubs here for whatever reason, I suppose just maybe because a good den site was made by the pipes that run underneath the road. I'm going to go a little bit up the slope just to investigate further on in case she's popped out further to the east of us. However, she, was, she kept them in a den site right here in this little culvert. Which I guess is a good place to hide a little leopard cub. I think you'll probably find that her cubs are now far too big to be keeping them in there comfortably. You never know with cats. Just like your domestic cats at home, the leopard's capable of finding themselves in the most interesting of places. Not today, however. Look. As winter starts to pull in and the temperatures get colder and colder each and every night, Karula will also be thinking about the temperature of her cubs when it comes to finding places to hide them. So if she can, she'll try and keep them out of the drainage line systems. Obviously that's not always going to work, but the places where water have cut river water has cut riverbeds into the area, those are the dips that get the coldest out here. And you'll see it with all of us. When we drive through them, we start to shiver first thing in the morning. Speaking of shivering, I didn't have to look very far to search for the owner of that missing glove. Did I, Brian? No, it was mine. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, Brian is the owner of the missing glove. Well, that was relatively easy. And at least Brian shall have warm fingers. Well, while we look for a leopard of our own, James racking up his total. He's arrived back at Inkanyeni. Stations, uh, at least not. <laughs> Sorry, I've been on the radio, everybody. It's been really distracting. Okay, everybody, this is a 4 4 female leopard with a. That's a leaf on her bottom. I've never seen Inkanyeni before. I know Inkanyeni is a golden leopard. You can see how gold this leopard is with four spots on each side and Raisa 
you reckon that this must be in Kanyeni and that it must be. Four four female leopard, golden colour. She's just stunning. She did have her head face towards us. There we go. It's so exciting to see a new leopard. And I guess very distinctive, those two sort of um, uh, very wide, almost eyebrows from which her whiskers come. Now, where are her babies? I forgot, of course, that she's got little babies. Oh, she's perfect, isn't she? So, very different colour from our Queen Karula. She's golder. She doesn't have, not quite as pale. And Magnolia, you say, has a wonderful name. You say leopards are such beautiful tree sleepers. They are indeed. Shall I take a picula, Avion? Mm, are you going to trademark that? A picula? That tr term, yeah. It is my trademark, yeah. No one's ever allowed to use it unless they pay me a hun one million dollars. Reasonable. I think it's very reasonable. I must confess that the picture you're achieving with your camera is infinitely better than the one I achieved with mine. I just love that little bit of green there. lovely. Now I have to confess that I don't remember how old this leopard is. I'm going to guess at roughly nine or ten because she doesn't look too young but it would be so exciting if the little ones were around here. Yep, she's ten. There we go. Thank you for that. Oh look. I'm just going to have to call this in again, of course, everybody, but I don't think there's anyone actually allowed on this particular reserve too close by, so that gives us the sighting all to ourselves. Ah, two leopards, three wild dogs, one elephant and a grey heron. Go ahead, Peter. Just trotting along, Pete. The station's relocated this female in the Marula tree just to the south and west of Cheetah Plains Pan. Please go for it, Andrew. Andrew's going to join us, of course. He is from Cheetah Plains, so he should be joining us. Now, I don't know if you can notice the colour of the, the difference in her colour. And I think she is slightly related to Kurula, or distantly related. But she is also, if I'm not mistaken, closely related to the line of the Campbell Copies female. And of course, the late Quatile was part of that line. And they are noticeably golder than any other leopards I've ever known. I have found there's the, the radio is going absolutely ballistic at the moment and they've managed to find those uh, the wild dogs which is great the color on that picture is absolutely magnificent it looks like it's kind of been it looks like it's been doctored Photoshop live Photoshop Live, yeah. Stunning, it's just little drops of green. Now, where are your little cubbies, <coughs> Lipides? 
And why have you not brought them for us to see? Oh, that's stunning. Look at that. <laughs> yeah, that's a face of experience, that is. Hey, she's stunning. Isn't she lovely? You remember, have you seen her before? Yes, with Sam. Now, Jean, you're in North Carolina, not the Jean that I know personally in North Carolina, but we've had that discussion. You say, does it look like she's eaten? Because she was stalking yesterday in parlor with Brent. Um, difficult to say. I would say that she, her belly does look relatively full, you know. No, there we go. No, it doesn't. I would say she has not eaten, Jean. Here we go. Ah, wonderful. Just gorgeous. It's going to come down with that. She's small, hey? It's about the same size as Karoo Light, see? No, she's definitely not eaten, Jean. She needs to have a bit of a meal. I think she'll be worth following for a little while, simply because I think it's quite likely that she'll... Well, no, you know what? I don't think she's going to go towards her cubs. I think the cubs were on and coral yesterday, and if she's looking for something to eat, then she's not going to go towards them. She isn't going towards them. She's going due west. So let's follow. There are some fairly nasty zebra wood trees here, but we'll try and get over them. There's Andrew. And she's also going south towards those big clearings. Ah, now, Zafari, you want to know, what? when I said a 4-4 leopard, you want to know what on earth I'm talking about? What a very good question. It's, it's her unique spot pattern above the nose. And what we'll do is we'll try and get a picture of her. We're going to stay just a little bit behind her because she looks like she might be trying to hunt. But she's got, on the left-hand side, just above the whisker line, four spots. And then just above the whisker line on the other side, she's also got four spots. And that's pretty unique to most leopards, and so that's why we say she's a 4-4 female. <clears throat> that's a kind of traditional way of um, identifying leopards, but, I mean, of course, they do have completely different spot patterns all over their bodies. So, like, Karula's got her wow written across her forehead, and many of our experienced leopard viewing viewers have picked out uh, different kinds of markings on all of the leopards that we've seen. And Penny Pine, you want to know what the tree the leopard was in. It was a marula tree, standard issue marula tree, Penny. Oh, yeah. Right, there we go. Get in front of her here. Sorry, VMP, I'm going to just ease over here. And there she is. Just stunning. Scratching and sharpening her little claws. Well, they won't be little at all, they'll be viciously sharp. She 
coming this way. Nope. Just maybe thinking about marking her territory. I'm, I'm unsighted at the moment, so you'll have to tell me. I'll just watch the screen, never mind. <laughs> Here she comes. Peculiar video coming. that. Now that tail is poised of course to tell anything that might come past here that she is no threat like a bird. Now I'm afraid everybody I cannot hear Kirsten at all. She's just coming through there's a lot of static. So I know that there are some questions, but I'm afraid I cannot answer them at the moment. Um, VMP, we're gonna go straight through here, I'm afraid. Watch your heads, everybody. You got it there? Got nasty thorns. There she is, I can still see her. She is in front of us. Just through there, where VM is showing you, she spotted, may have spotted something. The head's up and she's looking. There's a very thick drainage line through here. There she goes. Yeah, she thinks she may have spotted something through there. Maybe a diker or a bushbuck or Nyala in this kind of thick drainage line area. You can see just in front of her is a depression. And the depression, of course, has a lot of thick bush in it where something delicious might be hiding. Now see how carefully she moves and puts her feet. If you ever want to see a close-up picture of that, that BBC production, The Hunt, shows you a tiger moving through the bush, being exquisitely careful about where he puts his paw every single time. Exactly the same as that leopard's doing now. Now, just to give you an idea, I mean, we've got a substantial zoom lens on this camera. She is about... 40 meters away from us, that's about 100, 140 feet or so. And you can just see why binoculars on a safari are so absolutely crucial. I think she spotted something through there. I don't want to move just yet. There she goes. So patient, so quiet, listening, smelling, looking. And see how this sort of early winter vegetation completely hides her. The mix of golden leaves hiding her pelage. You see how she's hunkered down? See how she's stuck her shoulders out? Okay, let's move. Marvellous. This is incredible. What a brilliant sighting. I love this camera. I think it's fantastic. I love being able to watch them from, you know, giving them a bit of distance.
there she goes. Oh, watch out, VMP. It's not too thick to move in here yet, so we'll just keep going. Um, that might be the first usable leopard photograph that I've ever taken in my life. Well, no, I think it was usable. I'll show you just now. Uh, Nicole, you're in Texas. A very nice question from you. You say, what does her name mean in the local language? Well, I'm not entirely sure. I know that Gukanya means to light up. So, in Kanyeni basically means the light, as far as I'm aware. I might be slightly off there, but I'm pretty sure that that's what it is. I'm just going to quickly ask Andrew how many people are coming to the sighting, because we might have to move out. So just excuse me one second, I've now got to find the... <laughs> Where on earth is the radio? There it is. Hope you see how she's hunkered down there. Andrew, is there anyone else coming to the sighting? Okay, copy. Right, so we're okay, we can stay with her. See how she's gone into the thick bush there. I can't see what she's looking at. Cedric from Arethusa is coming from the other way. You can still see her there, Vimpi. She's coming towards the Towards this one. Got it. Okay. I'm unsighted. Watch out for this, everybody. Zebra wood. Very nasty form. Glad we've got Rusty's tires in here, I must say. There we go. She's just in front of us. Said when you get me visual, just keep coming straight. She's just in front of where I am. Yeah, she's just moving down the game path now, everyone. Now we're now about 60 meters from her, and we've still got such a wonderful view of her. It's amazing. And it's darker than it actually looks. Okay, she's gone down this game path. Um, we'll follow up. I've just lost visual. Yeah, I said she's still on the game path. Amy, you said it's amazing that they leave their cubs for so long. It is. It is interesting, but those cubs now, I think they're pushing six months, if not more, and so they're really adept at hiding. Can you see her anywhere? Negative. They're really adept at getting away and hiding. There she is on the termite mound. On the termite mound, that's it. There we 
go. So, Amy, they're perfectly adept. You know, if there's a hyena or something like that, those cubs are perfectly big enough to climb and jump up into a tree and stay away from harm's way. So they'll be absolutely fine. But remember, she has to eat. Her health must stay at tip-top condition if she is going to be able to look after them. So it's no good her kind of nursemaiding them if she doesn't have anything to eat. Leopards, of course, will often use termite mounds as vantage points in the same way that cheetah do. And sometimes they'll use them to snooze upon, but I think she's using that as a vantage. We'll try and stay with her for, I think, another five minutes or so. Because we've had such a wonderful sighting, I'm not going to put a light on her. Um, we'll, we'll just kind of let her go. There would be nothing wrong with putting a light on her, but it would just make her a little bit more comfortable. Let's go across to Jamie. She's got something larger to show you. I'll try and get one more view, otherwise we'll leave her. Mm -mm. There's a good boy. Are you going to come past nicely? No, you're going to come show me how big and scary you are. Yes, do a sideways dance. It's very nice. You're a very good dancer. Yes, okay, big head shake. All right, boy, I'm not going to do anything. We're just going to sit here nice and still let you come past. Yes, you're going to go pretend to eat that bush and then you're going to try again from that side, are you? Is that how we're going to play this? <laughs> yes, boy. I wonder if you really want anything under there or if that is just you pretending. I thought so. Yeah. That's what I thought. <laughs> yes, boy. It's okay. We'll move off. We're not going to do anything to you. You're very big and very scary, very tough. Still pretending. So this guy's is not overt aggression. This is what's known as displacement behavior. So it's a young bull, very young bull, just at the point where he's become independent in the last few years, following behind a breeding herd. And what looks like signs of aggression is not really, it's, it, it, I wouldn't describe it as outright aggression or in any way threatening us. He's trying to intimidate us which, of course, you have to take seriously. Never, ever become blasé or imagine that you know everything. The reason I knew that he was just pretending to eat before was that's what elephants do, called displacement behavior. Well, we, are, we didn't do anything to him. He approached us. He approached out of the bushes far away. As intelligent as these animals are, Sometimes they want entertainment, and sometimes the bulls need that ego boost. Now you're thinking about it again. Come on, boy. Off you go. There's some nice ladies to distract you. The more spend time that you spend with elephants, the better you start to understand their little behavioral idiosyncrasies, and you can judge how you're going to behave in those sorts of situations. Shame, now it's going to go cause trouble for that cow. <laughs> you know, push her away. We've had some interesting moments with elephants out here over the years. And we've all had experiences where we've had to deal with an elephant approach with a we stand our ground or try and drive away as quickly as possible. Now, my approach is to remove myself from a, a situation that I do feel is getting out of control. That situation, I felt, was perfectly in control. Uh, Katie, in South Bend, Indiana, welcome to the Sunset Safari. 
You were wondering about whether or not I have seen that video with, the, with Arnold Schwarzenegger and the elephant charge. I only saw a screenshot from it, which showed, I mean, that was intimidating enough. It was an elephant right behind the vehicle. But I, I cannot comment at the present time as to whether or not that was the elephant being naughty or if it was maybe some maybe something that the people did wrong in the vehicle. It's always a tricky situation when you don't see or can't see all of the facts. And the interesting thing about clips like that is no matter where they start, probably people only really start to film when things get interesting. So when the elephant has completed its approach towards the vehicle, we don't know what has happened before that. So we don't know what kind of approach was made. We don't know Maybe that elephant bull was fighting with another elephant bull. We just don't know all of the circumstances to draw a judgment. But I will have a look at it tonight, Katie, and I will form my own conclusions, and maybe we can chat about it again tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Safari. At the moment, we have a perfectly peaceful elephant herd sighting. The difficulty is, of course, is that we can all, all of us read elephant behavior, all professional guides read elephant behavior. Sometimes we come to different conclusions. Most of the time we come to the same conclusion. But there's no right or wrong. Oh, no, that's not true. There are right approaches and there are very wrong approaches. But in the middle of that, there is a gray area where it's up to each and every person's individual response. Now, I know how I handle elephants. I know instinctively. Well, I, I, I go with my instinct as to what I should do. I knew that that elephant bull was going to turn his head back towards us. I also did not at any point in that situation feel threatened in any way. But they do give mock charges, and mock charge is a very deceptive word. Here he goes. Now he's really eating, enjoying a bush willow. A mock charge is not, as its name suggests, a joke or the elephant pretending. Elephants will let you know. They will tell you unmistakably when it is time for you to remove yourself from their presence and you would be very well advised to listen to those signs because a mock charge is not a mock charge it is a warning charge and now it depends what he's going to do he's done a little shuffle just repositioning to get more food now at this point if he did decide to approach me a second time I'd deal with it in the same way I did before and then move off once again I think he was just showing Brian and myself how big and scary he really is. <laughs> Pretending like he never cared about us to start with. He is as a young bull, he's also relatively unrecognizable, not unrecognizable as an elephant, but his ears are relatively intact. But each and every single ear has a unique pattern of holes and nicks and cuts, even if they're really tiny on the edges of their ears. And as our elephant disappears off into the darkness, Corey, you were wondering about what causes those. The answer to that is that an elephant's skin, or the, the skin on an elephant's ear, is very, very thin, which makes it particularly susceptible to scratches and nicks from thorns. And then what happens is it gets a bit infected and possibly even you get ticks settling on it and that in turn eats away a bit more at the lining of the ear until they're left with a permanent etching or a permanent mark there. And that will never grow back. A flap is a flap for life in an elephant. And it's one of the ways that researchers identify the different individuals. And you'll find in scientific language you get all kinds of descriptions like a cup notch and a V notch in the middle of the ear, the top, top corner of the ear, the lobe of the ear. And all of those together will give you a, an elephant identification strategy that is unique as the spots of a leopard. Looking at Inkanyeni with her 3-3 spot pattern, and you've got that comparison there. And that's how researchers will identify the different individuals. It's something I spent Oh, sorry, it was a 4-4. It's a 4-4 spot pattern. Uh, it's something that I spent 
hours and hours and hours doing in the job that I used to work in before that was sitting with the elephant herds, taking photos because it was a closed system, which meant that we knew each and every single elephant and each and every single elephant herd, taking photos, finding their individual marks, finding, and it's not easy because an elephant herd, when they walk up to you, doesn't very kindly go, okay, here, take a picture of my left ear and now my right ear of the same elephant. A bit more tricky than that. They kind of intermingle, make life more complicated than you might expect when you're trying to identify them. So we had some interesting and frustrating times at times, zooming in, peering at minuscule holes of an elephant's ear. Now, as a daytime animal, I'm not really going to be spotlighting our elephant herd. Most of them moved off into thick vegetation anyway. So let's head back across to Cheetah Plains and back onto the back of James Hendry's vehicle. I'm just trying to find my spotlight, everybody, so that we can see more leopards. It's here somewhere. There we go. Oh, it's just attached to an earpiece. Never mind. I'll use my superb spotlighting technique. Vian was just very kindly complimenting me on my spotting of that leopard today. Of course, it was simply blind luck. As he said, uh, once he had complimented me, he kind of took it back by saying, you mean you were just looking in the right place at the right time? And I had to confess that that, in fact, yes, was the case. I said it was the finest marksman. You did. You said it was marksman-like spotting. Yes. I'd like to think that, but there is a piece of me deep in my heart that says luck played largely into that. Anyway, so it goes. We're going to head back towards Juma now and we are going to see if we can't spot Tundi again on our way out. Why stop at two leopard sightings when you can have three? Now, Virginia, you want to know if lion cubs get hidden away like leopard cubs. Yes, they do, up to a certain age. Now, remember, once they're six weeks old, they start to move with the pride. And so then they're not hidden. Then they are, well, they will be. If, say the pride's two females and they both want to go hunting, then they, much like leopards, will be stashed in one place and kind of given an order to stay, uh, they will stay. But, of course, they are protected far more by the pride than a leopard cub would be, and so they're much more likely to be out in the open than a leopard cub would be. Good one, thank you, Virginia. The temperature's dropped slightly, but it's certainly, I mean, it's not cold yet, which is rather marvelous. I've had an incredible afternoon, I cannot believe it. Sometimes the universe does smile on us, as I said. Even if it is with a bit of luck. Let's open this up. Book Diva, nice one from you as we go into the night time. You want to know if using a, um, if using a laser pointer is a no-no in the bush. Book Diva, no, it's not really. I mean, yes, it is to, to point out animals. Absolutely, it's, it's, uh, it's um, not ideal. But, for example, I watched a guy do it the other day. It was a very good, good example of using it at, at night. Um, he had an owl and he said, you know, he pointed with a laser pointer, but not at the owl. He pointed sort of two feet below it and said, look two feet above where the laser pointer is and there you'll see the owl. And that's precisely what we saw. So, no, it's not completely taboo. There is a bat flying in front of us. But I don't think we're going to try and track it. You don't want to super zoom it, Pia? I'm not surprised. Please don't. Viv, you say you heard your f and saw your first night jar in Ireland last night. Now, I'm assuming that's a square-tailed, no, hang on, it's the European night jar, the Mozambican is now the square-tailed, and you want to know when they leave here. I imagine, I actually don't know for sure, but I'll check for you. 
if you like. I can check right now. I think they leave Viv probably at the end of March. But of course, you see, a European night jar out here, although we get them, is not easy to... Um, we don't see them a lot because they're pretty much silent over here. They don't make a big noise. Let me just go back. I will tell you precisely when it leaves. Night jar, freckled European. Tap, tap. Mostly silent in southern Africa, you see, so it'll call much more where you are because that's when it breeds and it leaves in April, September, April, and most birds will arrive here in late November. So I was almost correct. Uh, around about April it will leave, so they've been gone for about a month. Now, they're so difficult to identify but for their calls that you know, we may or may not have seen one during the season. They are a bit larger than the others that we find here that's when they go. And you'll probably hear them calling quite loudly in Ireland because of course that's where they breed. Stunning colours on the horizon there. Maybe you can just hear the call of the white browed scrub robin. James Richard, you say, let, let's see if I can add a nocturnal creature to the long list of incredible sightings we've had today. Well, I shall do my level best, James. Perhaps a chameleon. Lovely circle, that would be nice. I suppose I, the two cats I have to see here still a caracal. If anyone from the Wild Earth team has seen a current Wild Earth team has seen a caracal yet, and an African wild cat which Jamie seems to have had a magnificent sighting of the other day. Have you seen one here, Ben? I saw a caracal. Yeah, no, a wildcat with Jamie. Oh, lucky you. And Eugene, Eugene is sitting in the final control shouting that he has seen an African wildcat. Well done, Eugene. You do it live next time, please. Right, we might lose signal here, but I, th I think the last time I went through here it was fine, so it might be okay. But in case, let's go across to Jamie and get an update from her. I hear that James has been talking about African wildcats, and that's just one of the many animals that we can see as we head out into these winter evenings. I know I always say this, but I'm always filled with a a sense of excitement once the sun sets and the temperature starts to drop. And that applies across the board on, in summer and in winter, but especially in winter. When I know that, first of all, you can see further into the bush, which means you've got a much greater chance of seeing something, even, even, not, not saying any names or hinting at any previous experiences, but even if it is a dacre hiding behind a bush, you'll still have a chance of spotting it. And then also, of course, the fact that the nocturnal animals start to come out a lot earlier in winter. And who knows what we could see this evening. And that's one of the things that makes it the most exciting because it is live. We might travel through the evening and not see anything tonight. But if we do, it is ten times more exciting. Like watching a sports match live. And then, of course, there's always the leopards and the lions wandering about as well. Brent is now headed for home. It's much too dark to be out tracking. It's to a point where you really do have to call it a day out here or run the risk of injuring yourself in some way. And we're just going to keep peering intently off into the bushes and the search for shadow will have to continue on tomorrow morning on the sunrise safari. We'll have to see if we can't find her then. I have a suspicion she's going to start heading back to an area where she's a bit more comfortable. She spent a lot of time in Hoffman's. That being said, the cub is now a lot older. It's just a month younger than Karula's two cubs which means that 
she could well be ranging further and further afield. And there's always the possibility that at some point tonight, Karula's also going to cross further north and come back to Juma. We'll just have to keep our fingers crossed. Not that you've really had a difficult time when it comes to leopards today. James has had extraordinary luck this afternoon. Two different leopards and wild dogs. Very, very chuffed for him, particularly in that gorgeous setting of the open area. And Lisa in Colorado, as we head off into the night, you'd like to add a smaller spotted animal to the collection. You'd like to see a genet. Me too, actually. I had a really enjoyable genet sighting after the sunset safari, which I know, I mean, Dave and myself were kind of spoiled, but we had a really relaxed genet on a termite mound. Now, that is definitely one thing I'm looking out for. We're just going to go through a bit of a dip. Hopefully, it. signal should be fine through here, but I'm going to go quiet for now, just in case it does break up a little bit. Seems okay. There is a something, and I suspect the something to be a night jar. I'll have to go f forward, I think. I'm catching a glimpse of it, it's blinking at me. Let me go forward a bit and see if we can't get it from behind the bush. It's either a bush baby or a night jar with that. Oh, it's a bush baby. Oh, no, it's a night jar. My mistake, bush babies can't fly. <laughs> that slightly red, small eye shine. All right, a bit far away for us to see, but I know that you were talking about night jars with James. So there is a good example. At this distance, I absolutely couldn't begin to tell you what species it is. It's probably a fiery-necked night jar. They're the most common in this area and in these riverbed systems. And he is planning on being out for the evening, going to go in search of various moths and insects. And we'll leave him to his hunting. We could well encounter one further ahead on the road. They like the roads in winter time and in summer, but especially in winter time because they're very warm. And for the night jars, it gives them full range of their abilities because they don't have to dodge trees at the same time. It was just the, the glint of his eyes that alerted me to his presence, his or her presence. And night jars and bush babies, almost indistinguishable in terms of catching the, the glint of their eyes with the spotlight. The bush babies, of course, as I mentioned, don't fly across drainage lines, so that answered that question for us. Lion. Oh, girl, you were very unexpected. <laughs> Do you know, I was, I promise you, you probably won't believe me. I was just about to say to you, there's a missing lioness. I promise you, I promise you that was going to be the next words that came out of my mouth. Well, she was pretty unmissable, sitting very kindly on the top of a termite mound. Hello, girl. Are you the missing Nkuhuma female? Or are the rest of you on the other side of that termite mound? That was a pleasant surprise. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> See, that's what we love about these live safaris. Oh, snapping up a moth. How cool is that shadow on the bush behind her? If I could just hold the spotlight still enough. Kind of got the shadow of her behind. That's really pretty. Hmm. Now, is this the missing Nkuhuma lioness? There have been three seen the last week. One we know is off denning little cubs in Torchwood, but the other one disappeared about a week ago and we haven't been able to find her. She's been leaving footprints all over the show, or at least some lioness has been leaving footprints all over the show. I have absolutely no idea whether this is her or not, and I think what we should do is just go 
to the other side of the termite mound and investigate quickly just to see if the rest of the pride isn't somewhere there. And then maybe we have located her. Hey girl. Thank you for that. <laughs> what a beautiful image. She timed that very, very well. Okay, let's go and just have a look around the other side because I'm dying to know whether or not this is the missing female or not. And then we'll come back to her. Hey girl, please don't disappear. Yes, no, no disappearing. Yes, good girl. I feel as though we have an understanding. I hope we do. Let's go and see if the rest of the Nkuhuma pride is just around this corner. And the answer is no. So she's still there. And I think I'm going to go back onto the road. I think that's going to be our best view of her. But looking for lions, I agree. First of all, your username is most appropriate. And second of all, I agree that that is a perfect way to finish off a sunset safari. It's a really rewarding feeling when you track and find an animal, but sometimes it's great fun to just find them by surprise as well. And then you're least expecting it. A big girl. the center of the spotlight off her face just so that we're not shining right at her but as a nocturnally adapted animal her reflective layers at the back of her eyes work really well which is why it is okay to spotlight for example a lion or a leopard but less enjoyable for things like impala or zebra or even elephants And agreed, Monique, in London. I do think that she does look a little bit thin. Her hip bones and her, her vertebra visible to us. Not overly so. I mean, not that we need to be concerned about her, but yes, she does look as though she could use a good meal or two. And possibly she's been off mating. It's so hard for us to tell at the moment. There's one female, there's one in Kormas that's that is pregnant and that will be due to give birth in the next few weeks. I'm not sure if this, I have no idea which female this is and I'm not going to conjecture until we know a little bit more. Just bear with me one second, I've got to call this in on the Game Drive channel. Uh, stations I've got one with Fuzzy and Gala uh, lying up on a termite mound at the junction of Gauri Cut Line and Central Road. And lo and behold, we have it all to ourselves. Nobody wants to come and join us and our magnificent lioness in the darkness. Who have we, oops, sorry, who have we got here? She's intently listening for something, and if we're really lucky, she might even call to the rest of the group. The, as last I heard, the other three in Kuhumas were in Buffelshook, not far from here at all. <coughs> so she won't be too far away from them. James has found not a night job, but a bush baby this time. Let's go to him. Look, James Richard, there is a bush baby. Very sweet. Can you still see it, Bimpy? A bit. Oh, you got in there. This is a wonderful sighting. We just saw these 
eyes bouncing across the road exactly like a gummy bear and I, we didn't know what it was to start with. I thought it was the first sighting of a spring hare for the Sabi Sands, but it isn't. It's a bush baby, a lesser bush baby. Now, wonderful. And we've managed to find a lion, which is just brilliant as well. I think it's disappeared there. I think it's pulled one. Oh, yeah. oh, there it goes. <laughs> right here. Uh, uh, and you see it there. Let's go back a little bit. There, he's right here. He's gone there. There. Now that's a tiny little thing, everybody. It's about, it's probably about six inches long, excluding the tail. Got him in the middle of the spots line. There. And into the tree behind. So cool. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, everyone, just before we go back to the line, we've had some sad news, I'm afraid, and the sad news is that Sam is not going to be coming back to us. Now, he's going to post a video about it on Facebook, um, so look out for that. But the, basically, the reason is, you know, he's, he's deaf in one ear, and his hearing in the other ear was starting to be affected by, we think, having this thing in his ear, and perhaps the dust, and perhaps the cold, and perhaps the conversations, whatever it was that ear started to close down and the doctors have advised him that he'd be crazy to risk the hearing in that ear. That's obviously the most wise course of action. So he's made the decision himself that he is going to not come back for the foreseeable future until they can figure out what's wrong with the ear. It's entirely possible that he might come back in the future and the door is certainly open for him. It's just a question of it being a fairly major medical risk at the moment for him to continue doing this job. It's really sad for us. We loved having him in the camp, and I certainly, for one, am very sad that his authentic, kind, and generous nature is not going to be with us uh, any longer. Hopefully, he'll be able to recover from whatever it is. The doctors will be able to figure out what's going on there, and he'll be able to come back, and that would obviously be a very happy day. So, so that is some sad news. Um, he will, like I say, post some kind of a Facebook video. He's making it at the moment. I'm not sure when that'll go up, but we will keep you posted. Okay, everyone, thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful drive. I've had an incredible time. Thank you, VM, for your efforts today. Brilliant stuff. We'll see you in the morning at 6 o'clock, 6.30 actually. But for the meantime, let's go back to the Lions and Jamie for the last bit of the show. We are spending our last few moments with the lioness and I know you've just had some sad news from James. We're all of course very very sad to see Sam go but I'm thrilled that we had the opportunity to get to know such a fantastic character and I'm thrilled that he had the experience that he did with Wild Earth. It is unfortunately just one of those things. A lioness has been looking off into the distance. Oh big yawn. It usually precedes, or can quite often precede, an upwards movement. It, yep, <laughs> here we go. She is looking hungry. Beautiful feline stretch there. Oh, did I see suckle marks there? It happened so quickly. I hope some of you managed to screenshot that moment. Let's try and catch up with her and see if we can't catch up as she goes across the other side of the termite mound. Zoe, you were wondering whether or not the termite mound is nice and warm and that's a really, really good point. Yes, those termite mound chimneys are often lovely and warm. It's the, pl the point at which they expel the heat that is being produced underground in order to maintain the constant temperature below the ground that is ideal for fungus production. And guys, if she continues north up this road, just so that you know, we are going to lose signal. We're 
going along Gauri cut line, which is unfortunately one of those areas that it's a bit tricky to maintain signal. Just have a look at those nipples. Let's just stop so that we can have a closer look. I think... Hello, girl. Oh, it's hard to tell if that's just a descended nipple, distended nipple or if there's some flattened fur around the site. I think that it might be. I think we might have a hungry mum. I'm not 100% sure though. It's just not quite clear enough for me to confirm that. But I suspect that those are suckle marks. She still looks like she's got quite a distended belly, though, despite her prominent bones. We're going to try and stay with her for as long as possible, but what a beautiful sight to end off our sunset safari than with a lioness walking into the darkness. That confident and powerful feline walk. Let's go catch up a little bit. She's heading in the right direction. She is heading towards Biffle's Hook, where the rest of her pride is, or were, when I last heard about them. Don't know where they are still. She's probably going to reunite with them and also go off in search of food. I was hoping that she might have a give us a chance to hear her call because as Becky in Wisconsin would like to know is there a difference between a lion and a lioness call and yes Becky there is and it's best it's most noticeable at close distance to the animal so it gets harder the further they are away but at a close distance it is relatively easy to hear that so when a lion does its roar it does the Sorry, I'm not as good as Brent at doing that. But then at the end of that call, they do a couple of mm, mm, mm sounds. Little soft, almost the ending point of that roar. Male lions, just change direction there. Male lions do that for far longer than females do. listening intently into the bush. Oh, she is a new mother and she is an expectant mother and she wants to go hunting. And definitely won't be following up. She hasn't spotted anything yet. Her body language hasn't changed. But we will not be following her once she does decide to go off the road and head off hunting. And I think that's what she's doing. I think she's going off in search of food as well as the rest of her pride. Looking a bit scrubby as well, like she's been lying down all day in the dirt. Big girl. Any trees? A lavatory out here. Oh, is she going to call? We are just about to be assaulted by quite a mm. serious olfactory assault. Oof. What a big yawn. And I'm going to leave you as we come to the end of our sunset safari for the sighting to be for Sam, who is departing from Wild Earth. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to all thank of you, you guys across the globe. Brian, of course, doing some fantastic camera work as always as well as to Kirsty and Jerry in final control. And we're going to enjoy the last few seconds in a sighting that Sam would have loved to be in and watch her walk off into the distance. <laughs>